All right, let's go ahead and call to order meeting uh, work session of the Kent County Board of Commissioners to deal with the sustainable business park again. Um, so we have with us this morning, I believe it's just going to be Dar and Steve and Steve too. Um, welcome, Stephen. Um, we're going to present uh, and then um, lead the responses and conversations. So, Dar, you want me to turn it over to you? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Steve Faber. I'm the Communications and Marketing Manager with the Kent County Department of Public Works. It's good to see you. Uh, I haven't seen some of you since we were stranded alongside the road uh, touring our facilities, so this is a little, uh, little better venue. Uh, before I start, I did want to thank everyone for the amount of time and energy uh, that you've dedicated to this project, to learning, uh, going on said tours, uh, per per participating in other informational sessions, uh, and really taking a, a good hard look at this uh, issue of the sustainable business park, but it's really about our integrated waste management system. Uh, I call trash the ultimate poster child for out of sight, out of mind. Uh, it is uh, put it on the curb and it goes away. And as we all know, uh, there is no away. Away is a facility. Away is either our recycling center or in Grand Rapids and the other five cities, the waste energy facility or North Kent Transfer Ta Station, or South Kent Transfer State or, uh, Landfill, or uh, another area landfill. And so uh, it's really important as we think about our community and what we talked about earlier, as our community grows, what is the system that we want to develop uh, that really uh, maximizes how we uh, use that trash, how we maximize the value of what is, what is thrown away and, and recycled in Kent County. Um, so we do have a brief presentation. I uh, apologize to the members of the Board of Public Works that probably saw this no less than four days ago, uh, but we have added some fresh content in just for those folks. Uh, and again, we uh, really want to entertain uh, your questions today as we go forward. Just a quick uh, review of our timeline. Uh, really, our decision timeline started back in 2015 when the Department of Public Works developed its strategic plan, which focused on diversion. Uh, it focused on relying less on landfills. Uh, this is really Kent County's legacy. This started with uh, what was Commissioner Vern Ehlers, uh, later Congressman Vern Ehlers, uh, who set forward uh, a vision as well as uh, the tools in our toolbox to really talk about landfill diversion and rely less on landfill moving forward. And that's when we set our uh, goal of 90% landfill diversion by 2030. And we've been working hard towards that. Uh, you know, uh, that's a bold vision. And so we really set out through uh, the next several years to do the work of what does that look like? How do we achieve that goal? What are the things that we need in order to achieve that goal? And Steve Simmons will talk briefly about and remind the group of that process that we went through, including looking at alternatives. What are the other ways that we get there? Are there other ways to get there? Uh, then, as we moved through that RFP process and got to a point in, the March, uh, in March of 2022 is when the Board of Public Works approved the uh, project development agreement uh, to move forward, which was really gave us a year runway to get to 30% design with our anchor tenant. Uh, and that was a very diligent process uh, that we went through, uh, culminating last uh, spring with the uh, design that we'll be talking about today. Uh, in the last month or so, we've been two months really, we've been going through additional processes, doing informational sessions with you, uh, and then uh, additional presentations. Many of you have been in on those as well. Uh, and then last week, 713, the Board of Public Works took up four action items. We'll go through each one of those uh, today so you can see those. Uh, I'll come back at the end and kind of talk about what's, what the plan is moving forward uh, and where we're going from here. But really, uh, we have this informational session in the, in the middle, and then there's uh, two committees, as well as uh, a potential Board of Commissioner vote at the end of August. Uh, just briefly, uh, the Sustainable Business Park Stakeholder Advisory Group uh, 1.0 has completed their work. 
Uh, this was a group that was formed right alongside that project development agreement in March of 2022. Uh, it was chaired by uh, Administrator Vandenberg, who uh, really helped convene municipalities, other stakeholders to really do a deep dive into this, into this project. Uh, that group did reach general consensus uh, last week about a direction forward. I think that report was uh, emailed to everyone. All of the minutes, the agendas, uh, the presentations, everything is available on our website if you wanna dig into any one of these topics and look at what that group uh, looked at. That group met bi-weekly, pretty much. Um, it, is, uh, uh, it was a really great process uh, where at the beginning of that process, all the members basically threw up on the wall uh, everything that was of concern or questions about the project, and then we systematically went through each of those. So the general topics, we're looking at alternatives and looking at what, what is the status quo? What if we do nothing? What happens? Uh, we looked at flow control and what exists today for the waste to energy facility in the existing district and what it might look like going forward. We addressed uh, countywide rate equity. So the idea that we have varying tip fees depending on where you live in our community and what facilities you access. And is that fair? And is it, uh, can we create a more fair system? We looked at policy and governance of the DPW board and how decisions might be made. We looked at market risk. So really diving into the project itself and what risk looked like for the project, uh, as well as uh, really what were the potential costs for customers, for businesses, for uh, the capital costs and, and doing a deep dive. All those things led to additional discussions and questions. So we convened with waste haulers uh, via the Grand Rapids Chamber of Commerce a couple times. Uh, we had Energia site visits, uh, Energia being the uh, lead partner as the anchor tenant uh, and, and talking with that group. Uh, we had one-on-ones with the city of Grand Rapids. Uh, the city of Grand Rapids has specific uh, uh, perspectives, if you will, as both being a hauler and being a municipality uh, and also having a diversion goal. They are one of the few municipalities in Kent County that share this goal of landfill diversion. Uh, we have access equity questions. So how do we look at who still gets to go to waste energy? Who goes to the new potential sustainable business park? Who goes to North Kent Transfer Station? How does that work and how do we make that more equitable? Uh, we looked at different models and scenarios for how we could arrive at consensus. Uh, and then uh, we also just consistently gave updates on the project as it continued to develop through that project development agreement. And then finally looked at kind of what is the system-wide tip fee and, and how do we model that and, and look at that. Um, so again, a very uh, thorough process. What it ultimately resulted in was a consensus around this primary recommendation of building out our fleet of facilities and then moving towards the closure of South Kent Landfill uh, by 2030. There are a series of secondary recommendations. I encourage you to go into that. Those are all really considerations as, as we move forward, things that we need to be thinking about as we move towards implementation. Again, consensus did not mean every member agreed with every single piece of every single recommendation, but it's, it generally said this is the direction that we should be moving in with these uh, considerations, with these things uh, in mind as we move forward. I'm going to turn this over to Steve Simmons to walk through a little bit, uh, just a recap of how did we arrive at this uh, particular solution. Thank Good you, morning Steve. and welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. So I am Steve Simmons. Uh, there are very familiar faces up here and there are others I know uh, this is the first time we've met. But uh, I am Steve Simmons. I'm the president and one of the owners of GBB, uh, a solid waste consulting company that has been one of the county's primary advisors over the past five years. We help cities, counties, waste authorities plan and implement solid waste policies, programs, infrastructure, and that's all we do. We, everything we do is all about trash and solid waste, so that's, that's all we do. We came into this project in about the 2018 timeframe when uh, the DPW hired us to help prepare a master plan for the sustainable business park. At that point in time, the BT BPW board had established a policy of achieving a certain level of diversion by a certain time. And we were kind of brought in as, okay, 
Now we need to implement. How do we implement the policy? And that's what we've been focused on for the past five years. So I'm going to review five years really quickly. I've limited myself to two slides. <laughs> I am an engineer by training, but I promise not to speak in acronyms and to speak the English language, okay? So, uh, but feel free also to ask questions. So in developing the master plan, it covered the entire spectrum of what would this project would be. But today, I'm going to focus really on the technology and the configuration of the project that is now presented to you for consideration. One of the first things we did was we developed a request for information, uh, a packet about this is what the policies are, this is the background of the county, what technologies are out there that could help us achieve the, po the policy goal. And we sit, submitted that to the world. And we got 23 submittals from local, national, and international firms about technologies. And we got about what you're going to look at today, we generically called mixed waste processing, which is kind of the front end of this project. And then it has various back end modules or elements that could be attached to it to achieve various outcomes, producing an alternative solid fuel, anaerobic digestion, which is what is going to be presented here today. Uh, we had things on how to make ethanol and biofuels out of waste and how to do composting. We also got proposals on just how to enhance the existing recycling and material reuse programs that are in the county or to adopt new ones. Uh, we got proposals on how to handle construction and demolition waste and on how to recycle uh, the ash that comes out of the current waste energy combustor. All of those were received and evaluated. There was a stakeholder review committee established to review these and give guidance. And these were members of industry, local government, state government. We had an Eagle representative. We had various stakeholders who came together who reviewed and gave comments on, we think these technologies fit our community. Or alternatively, we don't think these kind of technologies fit our community. All of that was considered. We took a lot of tours. We visited 12 waste processing plants uh, as a development team in Arizona, California, Maine, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, West Virginia. So we went out and kicked the tires of a lot of different facilities. And all of that, all those findings were taken into consideration and put together then later into a request for business proposals. So that was 2018, 2019 kind of time frame that all of that played out. In 2020, right in the teeth of the pandemic, we issued the request for business proposals. And again, uh, but I'm, I should have said, both of these processes were conducted through the County Fiscal Services Department. My friend Cal's here. And, uh, you know, we worked with Cal and his group to get these proposals in for the county to make sure we had followed all of the county procurement policies. We received seven qualified submittals. There were two that didn't make it past the administrative review kind of cut, and okay, this was not a qualified, and they're not to go on to further consideration. But we took seven into the first round of uh, reviews, and those were waste to energy, kind of a, a repeat of what you already have, and then there were proposals for various kinds of mixed waste processing. And again, a mixed waste processing front end with a plug and play kind of module on the back end. One for alternative fuel, solid fuel, one for composting. And then we also had a couple for anaerobic digestion uh, to make renewable natural gas. There was a multi-member evaluation committee established of DPW staff uh, economic development representative from the right place, some private sector representatives who reviewed and scored the proposals. GBB was just the advisor. We, we weren't a voting member of, of this evaluation committee. We were the county's technical advisor. Uh, we went through a couple of rounds of interviews, detailing, asking questions, Q&A back and forth. And ultimately, we narrowed it down to two companies that we asked for a final business proposal. We've got those final business proposals, again, rounds of negotiation, clarification. And then again, we, we took a trip to kick the tires. Uh, we went to visit 
uh, to both facilities, both companies had a facility. Uh, Commissioner Brevey uh, accompanied us on that trip. Uh, Commissioner Skaggs was uh, on the board at that time. And uh, they were in California. And I think out of that, one of the things to impress upon you or to, to say is both of the technologies were in operation at a waste management transfer station in California. So waste management, I don't mean the generic, I mean the, the national uh, public, the largest waste management company in America, waste management. And these were technologies when their private sector money was on, when they had to build these facilities that meet state mandated goals, these were the technologies that they invested in for their facilities. So again, another round I think of, of these are good technologies. They're not the only ones, but these were good technologies. In the end, uh, the selection committee decided that the Energy of Kent County Bioenergy Facility was the best to serve the needs. And I've done this, uh, as I said, our company, this is all we do. We've done it for 40 years. Got a lot of gray hair over here to kind of attest to that. And, and I can stand here confidently saying we have, project in front of you is the best project that could be configured to meet the policy objectives that were established. There are other technologies. I have clients who are trying to make hydrogen out of, you know, municipal solid waste. I've got others that are doing less techy things. But in trying to weigh and balance the what can get accomplished, the risk, the rewards, knowing that taxpayer money's in this, you know, I think we've struck the best balance of technology versus reward to meet the policy objective that was established by the BT BPW board. And that's my spiel. <laughs> Happy to answer questions uh, at any time. Is there more presentation, Dar? Yes. So maybe we uh, go through the presentation and then we'll open it up for questions uh, from the commissioners. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve, and good morning, commissioners, and thank you again for the opportunity uh, to be in front of you today to talk more about the project locked up I'm no I'm sure I did because that's what I do so after um, the last couple of years and uh, really this project started eight years ago we were able to bring uh, a number of proposals to our Board of Public Works last week Thursday uh, in August, we'll be bringing to them uh, discussion and a proposal around uh, future governance. Uh, but we wanted to bring these four items forward first and then be able to sit down and spend some time with the governance uh, conversation in August. So there were four things that we brought to the board last week that would help move this project forward and then deliver it to the Board of Commissioners. First is that we had to determine if this project is indeed consistent with the Kent County Solid Waste Management Plan. Now, the second was there's a need for changes to the existing Solid Waste Management Ordinance. Fourth item was there is a facility feedstock construction and service agreement that would be uh, put in place with Energia for the Kent County Bioenergy Facility. And the fourth item is a lease of the 40 acres that's necessary for that anchor tenant. So the solid waste management plan consistency process, it's not something you hear about a lot. Um, it's in the background. We have a solid waste management plan. I believe we've had one in place since 1990. It's a state mandated process and it really lays out uh, how the county and how each county manages municipal solid waste. Uh, recently, uh, as of December, that uh, planning process and that plan will look different moving into the future. In fact, uh, the county uh, board of commissioners through the administrator's office and our office received notification that the state intends to call for a new planning process starting uh, as early as this fall, but probably early next year. Uh, and the, your, this board of public or board of commissioners will be uh, tasked with appointing that committee uh, for that future work. That said is that we asked uh, Fishbeck Engineering, which is our engineer of record for the project, 
to take this project through our consistency review to give it a, a, a kind of a one-off, a an arm's length review so that it wasn't our department reviewing it, but it was an independent third party. And they in fact determined that this project is consistent with our solid waste management plan. Allegan County, because the project uh, and facilities are located there, was also asked to go through that process. And in February, they issued what's called a letter of consistency. Um, as I mentioned, that new planning process will come into play and we, the, the project as proposed actually really aligns well with that new part 115 uh, management process that will begin uh, in about a year. A couple other things to notice is that uh, Door Township, which is where uh, the, the project is located, approved a uh, planned unit development uh, approach for this project and for future development at the business park. So it's been approved at the township level. And then the solid waste permit, we need a processing permit that will be issued by the state and this process of consistency is consistent with and part of that as well. Mentioned a minute ago, the solid waste management ordinance. There's a number of things that we looked at as we drafted uh, an amendment. One is we had to ensure that feedstocks for waste to energy after 2025 and for the Kent County Bioenergy Facility in 2027 would be available for these two facilities. When the waste energy facility was developed and built and uh, began operation in 1990, the county entered into agreements with the six cities to ensure that the there'd be enough feedstock or material that would flow to that facility to make it operational, to support the operations cost and support the bonding that would be required. So we modeled uh, the changes in the ordinance along with uh, what was done in the late 80s and early 90s. Tip fee rate equity is addressed. One of the questions and concerns that we've heard for a number of years from our Metro 6 communities is that they're paying a differential rate to do the right thing. Waste energy has been in place since 1990. I think we recognize that Kent County as a whole has grown considerably. And the townships, many of the townships now operate similar to how the Metro 6 in terms of their population, their governance, uh, the businesses they have and the number of residents in those areas. It also designates which facilities that the waste can flow to. One of the things we wanted to ensure, and we've done this uh, in the past, is that no matter where you're operating in the county as a hauler, that you have access to a facility nearby. So while you don't have to deliver to the nearest facility in Kent County, you certainly have the opportunity to do so. So that if you're operating in northern Kent County, the, Kent, the North Kent Transfer Station is available to you to tip and to get back on route as quickly as you can to move that material or to, to move um, waste through the county and to take care of the customer. If you're in the central area of the county, you have the waste energy facility where uh, waste can be delivered. And if you're in the southern part of the, part of the county, you can deliver to the South Kent landfill and in the future, if approved, the Kent County Bioenergy Facility. The ordinance also defines the type of material. We're focused on municipal solid waste. What is that? That's what you and I put in our cart each day and ultimately set at the curb each week that your waste hauler picks up. It's also the dumpster behind the restaurant or behind that office building, uh, the material that looks very similar to what we place in our trash cart, but instead of uh, the recyclables getting into the right cart, a lot of those recyclables and other materials are making it into that trash cart. It outlines a, a, a process for exemption. Uh, Kent County has a long history of collaborative uh, public-private partnerships, and we've had an exemption process at the Waste Energy Facility since its inception allowing for material that shouldn't be delivered there. For example, we, get, we receive large loads of cardboard sometime that may have a little bit of waste mixed in and we're trying to get that into a value stream. Or a company might be delivering shingles or pallets or mattresses, other things that aren't appropriate for that. We exempt those things out. We have over 200 exemptions uh, with businesses in the Metro 6 area, uh, supporting the fact that those, there are materials that should go somewhere else and do. Uh, there's an effective date and there's a compliance date. The effective date would be 30 days after the Board of Commissioners approve the ordinance amendment. 
the compliance date is date future. So it would be something that would be taking effect in 2026 when the Board of Public Works and its DPW, through its technical committees, uh, make the recommendation to actually implement the flow control portion. And then that system-wide tipping fee would be the same throughout the county. Today we have it estimated between $87 and $94 a ton. Uh, we worked with Plant Moran for a number of months to take the existing business model that the county has. We worked with GBB, with Steve's team, as well as our own to look at futuring what would that tip fee look like starting in 2026 and then forward five years, taking into account our business operations, the adding uh, the bioenergy facility into our fleet, inflation and all those other factors that you have to think about when you're putting a pro forma together. I wanted to quick pivot just for a moment and show you these two pictures because I think it's really telling. Um, the proposed business park and the, the Kent County Bioenergy Facility can manage two types of waste. It can manage municipal solid waste, which is on the right, and it can manage source separated organics, which is on the left. But if you take a moment and look at those two pictures, they don't look that different. In fact, I would suggest that they aren't, other than your picture on the left is actually rich in organics. It's food waste, but it's bagged and it has some other contaminants in it, and all of that has to be processed out. Point being is that there are many uh, companies, uh, school districts, and other locations in Kent County that generate a lot of food-rich or organic-rich waste, and that material can go to the Kent County Bioenergy Facility, not as a municipal solid waste, but as a source-separated organic at a rate that is market rate driven. So your cafeteria at, at your uh, local f uh, school district or a restaurant or any other facility that processes or has a lot of food waste can actually move, separate all that material out if they choose to, and that can be delivered directly to the bioenergy facility as an organic material processed differently at a market rate. If you choose not to separate your organics, and there's a, a, a lower amount of organics in the regular municipal solid waste, you can deliver that there too. We're able to process both waste streams um, at that facility, and that's what's one of the reasons why we think this project is really exciting. We can handle source separated material, we can handle municipal solid waste. It just goes to a different door and through a different part of the process. The other things that came out of uh, the conversation with the stakeholders committee uh, and, and other meetings that we've had is the solid waste management ordinance and developing procedures and rules. We believe, and we'll be bringing this ask to our Board of Public Works in, in August, that um, based on the, re the feedback from the Metro 6, based on the feedback from so many stakeholders and particularly the advisory team, is that it's time that the Board of Public Works change a bit and the Board of Commissioners take a look at how they originally organized the Board of Public Works and to reflect 2023, uh, not 1968 when that board was first established. So in 2024, what's being proposed is, is that we would have a technical committee. That technical committee would come under the Board of Public Works and help advise the Board of Public Works on the details around implementation of different aspects of this program. So we'll work, uh, as, as suggested here, to refine source-separated material definitions, what can be pulled out of the municipal waste stream and sent to uh, a recycler or a processor who can handle that. It'll refine the exemption process. We have a great uh, approach that we use at Waste to Energy. Doesn't mean it can't be better or can't adjust to look at countywide uh, processes. So it'll look at location, material, and customer uh, we'll look at the phasing of new policies and rates to the technical committee, and then we'll continue to, to refine the ordinance review and amendment process within that. Um. I wanted to spend just a minute on the feedstock agreement. Uh, this is something that's been, that we've developed over uh, probably the past year or so since the Board of Public Works approved moving forward with the project development agreement. Uh, Steve mentioned trying not to be the engineer in the room. I'm not the lawyer in the room. Uh, Linda Howell, 
uh, obviously corporate counsel and we use outside counsel extensively. It's, it was a really collaborative effort between Energia and Kent County. And we used the waste to energy agreement that was developed in the 1980s as the template. It's proven to be a, a really good contract and we updated it and just uh, made it work that much better for this proposed project. So as it stands, the uh, contract would be a 25 year agreement it would be a, for the construction of the facility along with the guaranteed maximum price for the county owned facilities. Uh, it, would, it provides for the construction and drown, drawdown schedules. It has the acceptance, tens, acceptance testing and performance guarantees. Uh, when that facility opens, what will it be able to do and does it meet the expectations and the requirements that the county has? Uh, it ensures that waste, processable waste will be delivered it establishes a processing fee, just at, like at Waste to Energy where we have a third party operator. The Kent County Bioenergy Facility will have an operator and they, uh, to support their operation, uh, will be paid on a per ton basis. Uh, there's default remedy provisions, performance bonds in there, so we de-risk the project by putting in a significant language around what happens if something happens. So we've, we've made sure that we've uh, built that in th uh, with our outside counsel. Uh, and then it provides the specifics around facility design and equipment specifications and then maintenance of the facility as it moves forward. The lease agreement is a little less complex. Uh, ultimately what it does is it provides 40 acres of, of property at the Stainwell Business Park as proposed where Energia through the Kent County Bioenergy Facility LLC can construct and operate that facility. It's a 25-year lease. That's the runway that they need to ensure that they can then uh, finance and operate a facility of this nature. It's a 40-acre parcel. Uh, it, it addresses taxes. It addresses assignment and subletting. What can and can't they do as, as a tenant with Kent County uh, being the landlord? It talks through and, and, and ensures that there's insurance coverage in place. How do you handle indemnity? And then default and remedies similar to the uh, service agreement. And then some discussion on bonding. Again, I'm not the ex expert in the room, but we have a general understanding having worked with Energia and Kent County Fiscal Services and Bond Council uh, that we would follow a similar financing model that we used for the waste energy facility back in the late 80s and early 90s. It would be a 25 year bond that would be paid by tipping fees. Uh, the flow control ordinance as we proposed would be sufficient uh, and provide the waste volumes that we need to be delivered to any of our facilities again not just the Kent County bioenergy facility but either the North Kent transfer station waste to energy or the bioenergy facility and the department is responsible then for the mass balance and moving that material to the right location uh, it provides public funding 20 percent of the funding that's needed for the 80 percent investment by the private sector. Again, one of our, our core goals, our core, core mission and vision statements is that we uh, value the, the public and private collaborative effort here in Kent County in our department. And then, uh, again, not being the, the bond guy in the room, but it's our understanding that that is well below the authorized maximum for bonding capacity for the county. With that, I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, Steve Faber uh, to wrap up, provide a little more information on Energia, and we'll be able to answer questions. Thanks. Uh, I should also mention that uh, Andrew Dale and I believe Yaniv Scherzen from Energia are on a Zoom call as well. Uh, we decided not to fly him in two days after we flew him out last weekend, but uh, they will be back as well. Um, just real briefly on Energia, the, the private uh, uh, company aligned around the bioenergy facility, again, a publicly traded company. Uh, they have <clears throat> their technology and uh, facilities around the United States and the world, including in Michigan. Uh, they own and operate 12 facilities uh, in, uh, in the world uh, and uh, have 10 offices around the world. Um, just real quickly on their capacity and how it aligns with what we're doing in Kent County. Again, on the far left here, um, you have the inputs. Uh, you really have the residential waste, the uh, commercial waste, and then the SSO, which is source-separated organics, largely food waste. 
uh, that would be delivered to the facility for what we call pretreatment, which is really that mixed waste processing that's ripping open those bags, that's separating out uh, the material and running them through the process uh, in order to first reclaim the uh, material. So we know based on our waste characterization studies that about 75% of what is discarded and currently goes to a landfill can be reclaimed. Uh, we know that there's 75 to 100,000 tons of recyclable material in our trash today that doesn't make it to our recycling facility. So we didn't quite wash out that yogurt container as well as we thought we could and we threw it in the trash. That's the yogurt container that we get to pull out at this facility. Uh, we also pull out plastic film. We pull out metals. We pull out a lot of different things in addition to the recycling material that you might find in our single stream uh, recycling facility. Uh, there is residue, so there is uh, some material that still needs to be uh, discarded into a landfill, and then there's combustible residue. There's residue that we can send back up the road to waste energy to be incinerated and turned into energy. And that's really the, our waste hierarchy. Top of the pyramid is reduce and, and then recycle, then go to this bioenergy facility, then go to waste energy, and then whatever we can't process would go to a landfill. It goes through then, the, the, largely the organic part goes through the anaerobic digestion process. You can see on the top uh, that gets turned into uh, renewable natural gas. The little dotted uh, red box there is if something would happen with renewable natural gas and that's no longer the desired uh, outcome, you can convert these facilities to generate electricity. So they are robust. Uh, they have, uh, <clears throat> they do have a reciprocal kind of uh, technologies, if you will, that we can pivot. 25 years is a long time. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that we're building a facility that can accommodate changes, both in the market, as well as in what people throw away. So uh, this plant is built off of our waste characterization. We've done no less than, well, we did two. We're doing a third waste characterization study right now that really identifies what is it that we're throwing away. And this facility is really built off of that, but it can also move and adjust uh, in the future as things change. Uh, the, in the blue, uh, there goes through a drying process uh, that then uh, dewaters and goes into a fertilizer project product that can then go as a soil amendment for farms. Uh, again, there's a, blue, there's a little dotted uh, area there called pyrolysis. Uh, that's the process by which we uh, eliminate PFAS. Uh, that as new uh, regulations come into being, uh, as both all of our facilities come under additional uh, sort of pressures, uh, we I have identified this as a future uh, that we'll probably and likely need to uh, invest in is the pyrolysis component. Uh, we've also had some preliminary discussions with some of our local wastewater treatment plants that have a biosolid that currently they have to bring to a, a landfill. This potentially could be a partnership that helps them address that uh, issue moving forward. Uh, and then there are other ways that we can just improve that fertilizer pro product to make it even more uh, sellable and more resilient. So for our system on day one in 2027, if we flick the switch, uh, if 400, we are guaranteeing that 400,000 tons of MSW come through the front door. Again, as a community, we generate about 570,000 tons of MSW. So we will continue to need waste energy. We'll continue to need these other solutions for all of our MSW. So it's a minimum of 400,000 tons of MSW. It's sized to be able to take up to 650,000 tons. But on the front end, it's a 400,000 ton facility, as well as 95,000 tons of source separated organics, which again come through a separate door. That's the market rate door uh, with the capacity to go to 175,000 tons. That source separated door can handle pallets, it can handle liquid, it can handle uh, source separated organics, a lot of different things that we know the region is really calling for. We, will, we currently do not have this type of facility in our region to handle this amount of food waste and other waste that could be fed through a system like this. Again, as it goes through uh, the pre-processing and uh, ultimately uh, comes out the other end, we recover 150,000 gallons of water. We recover 95,000 tons of recyclables. For comparison, our current facility at, on Wealthy Street, our recycling center, processes 25,000 tons of Kent County recycling. So this would almost triple our recycling rate. We 
We generate renewable fuel in terms of renewable natural gas. This will generate enough renewable natural gas. The equivalent is eight to 9,000 ohms usage of natural gas. Uh, it could but also be used to power vehicles. There's a lot of other uses for renewable natural gas. It's the only carbon negative fuel currently in existence. Uh, and then also ultimately also creating this fertilizer product that can be applied to, to field. Again, on the facility, on 40 acres of the 200 plus acres at the Sustainable Business Park, this is an aerial view. There's a scale house. This is where uh, trucks come across, get weighed, similar as they do at any one of our facilities today. Uh, we have our main processing building. Uh, we have an office uh, similar to what we have the Recycling Education Center. We're building an education component to this. So the third floor of that facility will actually be an education center. Uh, this will be a world-class facility and we're going to want to show it off uh, and so having that and really designing it with tours and other things in mind uh, we have our digesters again two to start with with the capacity to build a third uh, the rng processing our wastewater treatment plant uh, so that nothing is leaving the site that hasn't been treated our odor controls this is a really key part um, if you took our landfill tour uh, you know on a hot july day what that smells like now. Uh, and so we have odor control, similar to waste to energy, where we've really uh, dialed that in and making sure that, that we're a good neighbor. Uh, we have our maintenance buildings. And then we also have 80,000 square feet of building on that site for a future tenant. We currently have uh, secondary tenants uh, that are anxious to uh, enter a project development agreement with us. Uh, so again, the vision of the sustainable business park is beyond just this anchor tenant, so secondary and tertiary tenants that can help us uh, process individual parts of our waste stream. Uh, and so we're, again, uh, there is a lot of economic development potential, not just in this project, but in, in the overall site. Uh, that's an aerial view of the, of the facility, which many of you have now uh, been able to see the, the field uh, that currently exists. Uh, there is a timeline. Uh, it's three years to deliver that project uh, from the time that we would break ground, which we anticipate would could be as early as this uh, this spring. Uh, but the project, the the facility itself, will not be fully operational until the four, first quarter of 2027. Just a little bit about what happens next. As you review this project, uh, you'll be reviewing the ordinance. You'll re be reviewing financing and ultimately the overall project. Uh, we are uh, doing an economic impact study with the Upjohn Institute right now. One of the things that came out and through uh, the Board of Public Works is can we really better understand what the overall total economic impact of this project is. Obviously, we're bringing $300 million of outside funding to our community, uh, the 60 jobs that get created by the bioenergy facility, but what, other, uh, what are the other uh, economic development potentials for that site? We'll be finalizing uh, some of the agreements. Uh, you saw the basics and the service agreement. Uh, and then uh, one of the other suggestions was really exploring an industrial development district, which this project would be eligible for, or some f form of uh, tax increment financing. So that Kent County can, can capture some of the, uh, if not all of the taxes. If there was approval of the project, then we'd begin to go into the financing and bond issuance. As Dar mentioned, we'd really be developing the ordinance procedures. So the ordinance is the legal framework, but we also need to develop the administrative rules and the, and the way that we would uh, enforce or implement that ordinance. And we really want to engage the community in that process. Again, the system-wide tip fees, don't, they don't trigger until we have a facility where we can deliver that material, which is 2027. So there's a, there's a runway here to continue to work with the community on what that exemption process looks like, what the phasing looks like. Uh, we have some ability to say, are we implementing those tip fees all at once or do we incrementally work towards that tip fee? Are there uh, certain sectors that we need to think of differently as it relates to this when we start up to minimize that initial impact for some of those customers? Uh, <clears throat> again, we're kind of under the assumption if it looks like SSO and it smells like SSO, source separate organics, it's source separate organics. And it doesn't necessarily need to be subject to flow control. So we can work through some of those things, especially with those organic rich uh, sort of uh, 
customers like schools and restaurants. We're gonna to continue to pursue grant funding. So we've already secured, as many of you saw, uh, $5 million for the project through the Michigan Public Service Commission. Uh, Eagle just uh, put another $5 million in the project to add to their $4 million uh, for the Sustainable Business Park in this uh, year's budget. Uh, there's another $30 million plus in the budget for next year for renewable natural gas projects like this. Uh, everything from the Fed to the state to the local is aligning around these types of projects and the funding for, from the outside is becoming more and more available. And that's what we'll continue to pursue. Any dollars that we bring in from outside in grants or other, uh, other projects really help drive down that tipping fee and that's what we're really committed to. We'll continue the project development agreements with secondary tenants. As I mentioned, we have two right now that are very anxious to get started, uh, being able to, to kind of work through their project. One, really focusing on that plastic film component of our waste stream, which is really the bane of our existence. Uh, it's something that we can't handle at our rice recycling center and would love to have a solution for in our community, uh, as well as uh, dealing with some of our uh, cardboard and, and ag waste. Uh, we would potentially begin site preparation. So we have to prepare that site for uh, Energia, which would begin this uh, fall if we get the, get the uh, approval. As Dar mentioned, we would begin looking at the governance structure. And then, as he also mentioned, this new materials management planning committee that the state is mandating that we move forward with. The state's goals are to reduce reliance on landfills. Uh, that has been explicitly communicated to our community and to the communities around us as how you align with where the state is going. And so we think this project uh, certainly aligns, if not leads, in that space. Uh, finally, uh, our kind of Gantt chart of how we move through this, um, I just explained a lot of it, but I just wanted to reiterate, a decision today does not mean that tip fees go up tomorrow. It really means we have a, a runway until the, until the enforcement of that ordinance. Uh, and then along with that, it addresses waste energy. Waste Energy's contract and that flow control ordinance expires in 2025. Mm -hmm. uh, this would uh, go in tandem with the expiration of the existing flow control ordinance and bring on a new countywide flow control ordinance to not only guarantee the feedstock for the bioenergy facility, but ensure that waste energy can continue to function. Uh, if we decide not to do this, uh, we do have an alternate path. Uh, we would be coming back to the Board of Public Works next year with uh, the landfill permitting process. Uh, this would be if we decide to expand south or decide to uh, build a new landfill. It's not actually a landfill expansion, it's a new landfill. Uh, we would need to go through the permitting process for that. That's about a five year uh, process to permit new landfills in Michigan. Uh, so we would need to begin that very quickly. That's why we've been trying to get out in front of this for the last decade, uh, as we know that these are our big projects that take a lot of time. Uh, and then we would really need to dig into how does waste to energy uh, function moving forward as well. Uh, because again, that flow control ordinance and the agreements with the cities expire uh, in about a year and a half. And to keep that facility whole, uh, we need a new model that would be able to do that. So again, from a timeline perspective, you can see kind of where we are and where we're moving forward uh, as we uh, go through this. Uh, so um, I won't belabor that uh, anymore. And with that, I think we're ready for questions. Thanks for being patient. All right. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation. Uh, we'll now see if any commissioners have questions or comments on any of these issues. Commissioner Sparks. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is very impressive. Very, um, a lot of work went into that, so thank you looking at our environment and the things that we need to do to protect our uh, future generations. So thank you for that. I do have some concerns and some questions and probably most of it teeters around small businesses. Um, and I know that we don't have exact numbers or anything like that, but uh, last month there was something put out by the chamber that kind of the numbers don't match the same. Uh, talking about the different industries, the low, the averages, the highs. So that doesn't match what we have here. And I'm really concerned about the, the tipping fees and uh, how the stakeholders and how the, um, how the residents are going to feel about 
this when they come and their their fees are you know doubled or whatever. Um, and I know that Commissioner Brevi is trying to help me through this this process, but I just want to make sure that we're making the best decision for those that will be impacted. Um, there's a great impact for all of us on an environmental you know side of this and uh, for our earth which is very important but how do we get around explaining this or how do the small the the haulers get around you know explaining this um, and we keep businesses intact yeah thank you for your questions Commissioner Sparks and I think there was three or four in there about five six <laughs> yeah so I'm gonna, I'm gonna I may yeah. pick them up in, in opposite order but I'm gonna ask Steve Faber to join me um, one of the Steve will help, I think, address some of the questions that you had around the increase in residential cost uh, with a survey that we did to help inform kind of the direction we were going and what does it mean to have a higher tip fee. I, I think if I can maybe just take a step back for a moment and, and just let's think through what we have in front of us. When I became director, I looked at the future and I looked at Kent County's system and we, Steve mentioned Vern Aylers, who was instrumental in his day on our Board of Public Works, really setting a trajectory of reducing what was going to landfill by putting in a waste energy facility, by taking over the Recycle Unlimited nonprofit that went out of business. We stepped into the space of recycling 33 years ago, processing recyclables for that amount of time. But what we saw coming out of the Great Recession, which is something that came up during the LHR meeting, is that because our waste energy facility is at maximum capacity, and because our recycling center, residents are not putting the right material in the right cart. And, and more than that, they don't have access in many ways. I can't think of a multifamily situation where if there's a dumpster where you place your trash, where you live, that you have recycling available to you. I think in the city of Grand Rapids, they've tried to address that well by providing carts to, to offices and providing carts to multifamily. But most apartment complex, townhomes, condos don't have access unless that property manager has intentionally made that a part of their solution. And so when we make a decision individually, either as a business or as a resident, to place something in our trash cart and we've made a decision it no longer has value. It now becomes a community situation because we have to address it. As Steve mentioned, you know, you put it in your cart and it goes away, but it really does not go away. We have 7 million tons of trash buried at the South Kent landfill. We've torn up 300 acres of Byron Township land that can never be used for anything else. I think the fundamental question is, is, is can you make a pivot to a sustainable approach that captures the value of that material that we are currently burying in the landfill? And for those that have been in the landfill face, it's a visceral experience. Um, we have 800 truck deliveries a day within our system. And that's only half the trash in Kent County. 800 trucks deliver trash to one of our facilities every day. And, the, and, and as we look at these solutions, what, what we learned early in the right place was so instrumental is they helped us understand that the truck that's on route today, that's breaking route, that has to tip and get back on route, has to be able to go somewhere and tip. That 800 truck deliveries, they have to be able to tip and get back on route. But until you sort all that material out that we've decided to mix together, there's nothing you can do with it. And that sorting process is where this comes into play. And so when you think about the cost, yes, we are taking on more costs, but we're making a decision about future economic impact as well. We won't have to put additional landfill space in a community that takes it, that property, which is farmland today, and no longer is taxable, that cannot be built into a residential plat, that cannot become a commercial development, and becomes a liability literally forever. We try to be a great neighbor at the South Kent landfill, but it's a landfill. And so you can only be so good of a neighbor, um, and, and that impact is real. 
one of the things that we looked at, and, and I'm probably repeating myself, but I think this one probably re, uh, deserves to be repeated. Landfilling is, is certainly always going to be needed, but it was an option that came out of the 1970s when dumps were the solution. And a dump means it was just uncontrolled. You just threw it wherever you threw it. And so la sanitary landfill was that next step in the progression. I think what I would speak to today and one of the, the issues that I was dealing with as the director when I became director eight years ago is that knowing that South Kent landfill was closing in 2030, if I make a recommendation to our Board of Public Works that says we need to design, permit, build a new landfill, and let's just say it operates for 30 years and it operates from 2030 to 2060, and then we close it, and then we have to move into post-closure, which is another 30 years. I've just make a, made a recommendation to our Board of Public Works to develop a liability for the county that goes to at least 2090. And that was something that I really wrestled with personally and professionally. And that's why we really began to take a look at, are there other approaches that are better than what we're doing right now, which is landfilling? Because it is about environment, but it's, that's only one piece. It, it's about environment. It's about taxing. It's about economic development. It's about economic impact. It's about land use. There's so many things that are affected by a landfill operation, whether it's in Kent County or whether we decide to dump our trash in Allegan County, which is our next step, or we decide to dump our trash in Ottawa County or Mount Calm. Um, that's, in my mind, not a long-term solution. So, so Steve uh, took the opportunity to do a, a epic MRA poll to better understand where the residents were at. So I think Steve is probably best positioned to answer that question. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll answer it a couple ways. Um, so we did do a, a, a representative sample, northern, and central, southern Kent County, typical to any poll that you would do if this was a, a ballot initiative. And uh, one of the things we tested was uh, sort of the appetite for uh, cost. And so that poll found that 80% of residents in Kent County, again, a representative s sample, uh, would support up to a $5 per month increase to their tax bill to do something different than a landfill. Uh, their main reasons for supporting that was economic development, and then it was uh, protecting the land, water, and air of Kent County, and then ultimately it was uh, preserving open space. Uh, specifically to your question, um, this is, it is tricky to understand what is the actual cost impact increase um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, it depends on where you live, it depends on how much you throw away, it depends on what you throw away, it depends who your hauler is, it depends on what your neighbors throw away. There's all these variables that ultimately translate into what you get in terms of a monthly, quarterly, yearly trash bill. Uh, that being said, there are basically three main profiles in Kent County today, if I can just describe those. One are individuals and businesses within the six cities within the current flow district. They're currently paying $75 per ton to deliver for their hauler to deliver to our facility there, 75 a, ton, a, a, a month, or a, a, a ton, sorry. We don't think in tonnage. Um, on average, our waste characterization fee, though, our studies show that on average, households in Kent County generate a ton or less of waste. So it's so if you think about your trash bill and you live in Kentwood, $75 of your trash bill is related to that tip fee. The rest is related to transportation, to, uh, to staff that drive the trucks, to all the other factors that, go, that get figured in. Industry standard is about a third of your trash bill is tip fee related. So it's not as simple as saying, well, we're gonna double the, the tip fee, that means you're gonna double your trash bill. That doesn't happen, it's only on that portion of the, of the bill, the tip fee. So 75 if you live in the current six, 46 today if you uh, live outside of the flow district but deliver to either North Kent Transfer Station or South Kent Landfill, that's our tip fee at those locations. The board approved that to go to 55 in the fall. Just adjusted for inflation alone in 2030, it'll be a $65 a ton tip fee at South Kent Landfill. Uh, there's a recent study Landfill fees are going up. Midwest rates went up 22% from 2021 to 22. So it's not as easy as, again, saying, well, 
landfill stays static as a tip fee. Those tip fees are going up too, so customers are going to experience that increase regardless of whether you go down this road or not. So in the flow district, outside the flow district, but delivering to one of our facilities, and then less than 20% of MSW, according to our data, uh, flows outside of our community today. 80% of MSW touches one of our facilities, either Waste Energy, North Kent, or South Kent, and about less than 20% leaks out, if you will, to other area landfills. So there are five private landfills within 30 miles of the epicenter of Kent County. They have up to 90 years of uh, permitted capacity, uh, on average about 30 years of permitted capacity at those landfills. So it would be fair to say if you are a customer on the edge of Kent County that is having your waste picked up and delivered to one of those private landfills at their rate, it's going to be a steeper increase than if you are a current resident or business in the six cities and that waste is being delivered to waste to energy. I will say we did a $20 jump. So we went from 55 at waste to energy to 75 about two years ago. So a good way of figuring that out would be look at your 2019 trash bill, look at your trash bill today, kind of pre-recession or pre-pandemic trash bill, and how much did that $20 increase impact your, for me it was about 5% in the city of Grand Rapids. That's what my trash bill went up. So on the residential side, our spreadsheet shows if you live within the city of Grand Rapids, you're getting about a $2 a month increase, or one of the six cities, sorry, about a $2 a month increase. If you're outside the six cities, but your trash is delivered to one of our facilities, it's about a three and a half a month, $3.50 or $3.50 increase. If you are one of those on the edge with your waste going to an outside landfill, um, you're probably seeing more of a $4.50 a month increase to your trash bill. I can't tell you what you're paying today. I can't tell you if that's a big number or a small number for you, but that is the, who's going to experience the greatest increase. But again, that represents less than 20% of our total MSW that's, that's generated in Kent County. So that's, again, it's tricky. On the, on the commercial side, similarly, we have to kind of go through that process. There are, and again, flow control and that system-wide tipping fee only is for municipal solid waste. It does not apply to recycling does not apply to source separating material, construction and demolition waste, industrial waste, yard waste, all those other things are not part of that system-wide tip. If I can uh, interject here, one of the questions also had to do with some uh, assessment of the chamber's numbers. And so I know that uh, Commissioner Brevy and I and Al met with the chamber recently, so maybe, Al, if you can just maybe comment briefly on that. I think uh, as we reviewed the numbers with uh, Rick Baker and Josh Lunger, uh, the problem is the numbers were based on uh, 2001 figures for one piece and then the, or, I'm sorry, 2021 overlaid with this plan. And so the, we really, certainly fees have gone up in different parts of the county since 2021. So we're not really comparing apples to apples. Uh, the chamber would have to go back through and do all the base work they did to create the data in 2021 for 2023 figures, which would reduce the percent increase by some extent. And so I, I don't know if, if either of you had anything you wanted to add, but I mean, we, that we really don't have numbers that accurately reflect what that increased cost would be because of that. Yeah, I would say that with, um, the analysis looked at 2021, so two-year-old uh, bills uh, for that assessment suggesting in the six city area it was somewhere between a five and fifteen percent increase to move to the sustainable business park based on the tipping fee increase that's recommended now compared that to what the actual bills are in 2023 uh, they did not do that analysis so again we'd have to look at what would be the difference between a 2021 bill on average and a 2023 bill uh, if it went up 20%, somebody, maybe Steve was saying that on average in the count, in the state it's gone up 20% in tipping fees. Maybe it's equal, I don't know. Uh, but that analysis was not there. Yeah, I'd like to add too, and we understand that's really difficult, and, and um, certainly Chamber is doing its level best, I think, to try to nail down those numbers. 
but it's not easy because you're dealing with so many different sectors of business, residents that live in different communities. Um, I'll share my example, if that's okay. My finance director, Kim Williams, and I both use the same hauler. We live in two different townships. We have the exact same service. I mean, like the exact same service. My bill is 58, hers is 107. It just is what it is. It, it's how the market in that area and the industry, right? No, it's not good or bad. It's not right or wrong. It's just how that played out. So that's the challenge that we all have in trying to navigate this. What we can share is the tipping fee. We're on the wholesale side. We provide disposal services. We provide recycling and recovery services. The tipping fee is about a third, 25% to 33% of the total cost of your bill. And that's where we're trying to keep our focus because that's the business we're in. But we're doing our best to help inform and we've brought different solid waste consultants including Steve Simmons to the table to help in that conversation where we can. I should clarify, when I give you those numbers, Commissioner, that was relative to um, commercial establishments, not residential establishments. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Bujak. Thank you, Chair. I've got five questions. I'm not going to throw them all at you at once and make you memorize them. Hopefully we did pretty good the first one roll, but we'll yeah, so um you said you have a website. Is that reimaginetrash.org? Yes. Okay, I think it's important that we all note that because we got a lot of residents that are now beginning to learn about this program and they're coming to us and asking us, well, how do we get better informed? And uh, I see you have a nice video out there. I think that's a great place to send them. So re www.reimaginetrash.org. Uh, my next question is, what about the deer? We have a deer sheriff who <laughs> picks up deer and drops them off at the landfill. Will this sustainability facility deal with that? Um, it could. Uh, I'm not sure how much pre-processing the deer will need, but it's my understanding the Kent County Road Commission, I might be wrong, in the, I think it's like 70 tons a year. It's some crazy number. We work with the Road Commission and they deliver that to the South Kent landfill today. It may be that might be something that's and we right and we take livestock dead livestock too it's just it, it's something that you don't know about but it's reality right um my sense from energy is that yes they can process that uh and make renewable natural gas but i i don't know to what extent uh, and whether that's appropriate but by gosh and by golly if we can we will okay i guess that was a good question i mean it's, it's <laughs> obviously something that we're going to have to deal with pigs um, and cows and chickens and yeah my next question is because this facility is going to be in Allegan, do they participate in this program Allegan county um, would have to make a decision whether or not they want their waste to move to this facility certainly it's sized where it can expand to take both Kent and Allegan County waste. Um, to date, uh, I know that the Allegan County Commission has made the Sustainable Business Park part of their strategic plan, and Door Township has supported it with uh, $200,000 of ARPA money, and we're also going to begin a conversation around tax increment financing and industrial development to districts, as Steve mentioned, as ways to partner together with this. Um, but to my understanding, at this point, Allegan County won't be sending waste. We sized it to deal with Kent County, but with some expansion as well. Okay, a lot of concern I'm hearing from commissioners is regarding flow control. And um, I guess Allegan, including Allegan, would alleviate some of that flow control concern. What about bringing in materials from other places? I understand Detroit unfortunately i i wouldn't normally want detroit to bring their trash to put into our landfill but if we have a sustainable business park and we need flow control materials is the possibility of importing materials from detroit being considered or been talked about not been talked about um for a couple of reasons 
so I'll, I'll, if I can paint the picture for a moment. The Kent County Refuse Disposal System, which is the actual legal name of our system, was put in place by the Board of Commissioners for the intent purpose of, of addressing Kent County disposal needs. Now, certainly our waste energy facility takes contraband and other materials from law enforcement from across the region. U.S. Department of Treasury, um, a Homeland Security, State Police, local law enforcement. So there are those opportunities where, where we serve a larger area. This facility could serve a larger area, uh, but we're sizing it to meet Kent County's needs. Um, I think the state as a whole has a real issue around landfilling. In fact, there's more trash buried per person in Michigan than any other state in the country. And I think a lot of that's attributed to East Coast and Canada and a lot of that waste moving into maybe the Detroit market. We don't intend to take waste from out of state or out of country. Um, I think our solution needs to be for West Michigan. But I think where this facility stands up, and this is why the state of Michigan is supporting this um, with significant financial uh, backing, uh, to date I think we have $12 million that has, has been set aside by the state through EGLE and other means, Public Service Commission, is that they're recognizing that this is a template. It may not look exactly the same in another, another uh, part of the state. Another community may take on a, a different configuration, but it's back to the 800 trucks a day that has to go somewhere with all this trash that's commingled that has to be separated out. And this is a solution. And I believe this is a solution that many people, in fact, I know many people across the country because I'm receiving calls from Phoenix, Arizona, and Dane County, Wisconsin, and many other communities that have a question. They're like, what are you guys doing up there and why? And what does that look like? And because there is a momentum, as Steve mentioned, there's an alignment of federal, state, and really local thinking around, we need to do something very different. And we're trying to figure out, and I think we've figured out what that different looks like. Okay, my final question is, um, there's, you said 200 acres out there, and we're, I'm sorry. There's 200 acres, and you said the business park will be 40 acres. What are we gonna do with the other 160 acres? So there's a phase one and phase two. There's, a, there's roughly 250 acres between Byron Township and Door Township. The anchor tenant would be the first 40 acres. Additional secondary tenants could take the other acreage. Steve mentioned that there was two other companies that are discussing entering into project development agreements. It would be those type of companies. Again, the reason why the county wants to retain ownership is we want to make sure that the companies that site there and what they do are helping Kent County divert material for reuse and moving material away from landfill. So our goal is we'll, we'll set the environmental standard, we'll set the business standard. We have a development uh, process and standard that's been developed. It was, it was mirrored off from the Western Michigan Industrial Campus that you see along US 131 near Kalamazoo to ensure that each company that locates there uh, does it in such a way that is complementary to each other and to a standard that Kent County would, would you know, attain. But we're looking to be the, the landlord because we want each company coming in there to solve a solution for us or solve a problem for us. And if, if necessary, you mentioned that kind of out of county or out of you know, Detroit market, some of these facilities need more feedstock than what we can actually produce. So they would be bringing in plastics or other things from other markets to be processed here. So you're actually bringing in economic development by bringing feedstocks to West Michigan. Commissioner Diaz. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of questions here, if I could. Um, you mentioned that an economic or uh, environmental, I think it was an environmental impact study was going to be done. Um, can you mention again who it was that you're partnering with to, to do that study? So it's an economic development economic impact development. study, okay. and, and it is actually with the Upjohn Institute okay. out of Kalamazoo. Um, and then, um, so also in the presentation, it mentioned that the tipping fees are being used to pay off the bond. Um, I was 
wondering first about how long we expect or think it would take to pay off the bond, and then how would the tipping fees be impacted once the bond is paid off? So where we can, we would pay those bonds off early, but again, not being the financial guy in the room, not understanding bonding, the bonds would be 25 year bonds. If they could be paid off early and we're able to do that, we would. Uh, waste energy, uh, I'll use that as the example. When the bonds were paid off, we dropped the tipping fee by $20. Okay. So paying for the project, the CapEx, if you will, is a significant part of the overall equation. It takes a building and equipment uh, to do what we're trying to do as opposed to excavators and miners and building and operating the land. Okay, thank you. Um, and then um, personally for me, I'm, I'm very much uh, supportive of the idea and concept of this project. We have all experienced the smoke from the wildfires um, up north in Canada for the last couple of weeks. Um, and we're now being put into this situation where ideally uh, we would be in a position to have 100% clean energy. And I think that that's where the state is moving toward. And so my main, uh, and it's understood um, that uh, by moving forward with this project, we would have a lot less methane escaping into the um, environment as opposed to the carbon dioxide that would be um, used by the reno renewable natural gas. But um, as far as I understand, most in order to meet the uh, uh, outlines of the Paris Climate Accord uh, by 2050, that is pushing us or pushing the world to 100% clean energy sometime in the future, whether it's 2030, 35, whatever the case may be. And so my question is around the natural, the renewable natural gas aspect of the facility. Um, say if we were, and, and of course, uh, I've done a little bit of research and I found um, that um, renewable natural gas is still required for some uh, industries. Um, and being in the cold state, it would still be required here in the whole aspect of electric vehicles and whatnot. But if we were to move eventually one day into the future um, towards 100% clean energy, no natural gas, whether it's renewable or not, how feasible would it be to separate that aspect from the rest of the facility? Is that possible at all? Um, would it be? Would there be a way to essentially capture the emissions that would be uh, saved from going into a landfill and into the environment without actually shipping that natural gas out and using them? I'm, I'm uh, curious about that aspect of it. Sure, great question, and thank you for that. So the EPA, I think, issued a study in 2021 that showed that 15 percent of the overall methane emissions in the United States comes from landfill mm -hmm. operations. Our, we have a landfill gas to electrical generation plant at our South Kent landfill where we capture the landfill gas, uh, move that into generation. We have two power plants, we're adding a third. We currently generate enough electricity there to power 3,000 homes. Our waste energy facility uses a renewable, although uh, maybe controversial, we use trash to generate electricity, not unlike what we'll do at the York the bioenergy facility, we generate the equivalent of 11,000 homes electricity for, that, for uh, with the waste energy facility, which is about the size of the city of, of Walker. Our goal, and unfortunately, landfill gas collection systems aren't perfect. In other words, there's a time when your working face is exposed and you don't have gas wells installed. And even if you do, you're still having a certain amount of gas escape just because of the way it's designed. It's not. It's not a closed system. We worked with DTE and Consumers Energy, and it's my understanding through Energia that Consumers Energy is, is um, the leading candidate to put in the transmission and distribution line that will be installed at the uh, bioenergy facility at the sustainable business park to take the renewable natural gas and put that into the grid. And I think I always get this wrong, but I think it's 7,000 home equivalent so in the Midwest, you use more gas than if you're in Florida, right, because of the heat in, in the wintertime. So we'll be producing enough renewable natural gas on an annual basis to meet the needs of 7,000 homes. And that will happen locally, right? That molecule looks exactly the same as uh, carbon-based uh, natural gas, but it'll be used locally. There's certainly some incentives uh, that are available for the generation of renewable natural gas. I can't speak so much to the, to the, uh, the Paris... Um, item that you brought up, but I do know 
based on our understanding of the, the state policy. We're seeing that with the Michigan Public Service Commission. We're seeing, I think, with the governor and in the, in the legislature. Uh, we're also seeing DTE and Consumers Energy announce that they want to be carbon free sometime in the future and they're closing down most of their coal plants, which I think is occurring sooner. Generating electricity uh, in a renewable manner that's carbon neutral is much easier than natural gas. You can do it with solar, you can do it with wind, you can do it with hydro, you, there's a number of different ways. There's many fewer options and the main option is uh, anaerobic digestion to create renewable natural gas, which is why this plant is getting the interest it's getting because it's one of the solutions. Dairy is another one. Food waste are the two big ones, and this is what we'd be addressing is the food waste. Okay. Um, again, sorry, I don't, I don't mean to take too, too much time here, but again, my, my concern again is around the natural gas aspect. So are we, to be clear, are we saying that there would be, by building this facility, because it's looking like it wouldn't be functional until 2027, there's a 25 years and whatnot there would be no, we would have to keep using natural gas, then it would lock us into that system for 25 years. Is that what you're saying? I understand. No. So we mentioned earlier in the presentation, you can pivot. Okay. This facility can go combined heat and power or electricity generation. So you can produce steam to generate, or you can produce steam and or you could generate electricity from this. So for example, our landfill gas program that we have at South Kent Landfill, we take that gas, we clean it up a little bit, and we move it into combustion engines and we generate electricity. This renewable natural gas has to be cleaned up more before it can be injected into the grid. If there was a decision in the future that natural gas was no longer the solution and we were going to electrify everything, we would put in generation and be able to generate electricity from that renewable natural gas instead of putting it into the grid for residential or commercial use. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Wooden. Thank you, Chair. Um, first, returning to kind of put an additional point on the discussion around tip fees and its impact on customers, that uh, if I also remember correctly, the stats that were created were not just based on 2021 consumption data, but even in some cases, 2017 tip fees, correct? They were basing it on a baseline of a $45 per ton tip fee in the core six, correct? I don't know if it was that amount, but it was a lesser amount. So they weren't, it wasn't an apples to apples comparison to 2023 rates. And if I'm also remembering correctly, the outflow numbers were also based on, as kind of Mr. Faber noted, an ex more, I wouldn't say extreme example, but a, uh, a smaller example of someone who is not only out of the flow district, but also using a private hauler who has their own facility going to, uh, going outside of the South Kent landfill or any of our facilities. Um, and as you noted, 80% of customers already have their trash going to a Kent County facility to begin with. Right. Um, and those 20% impacted are also more likely, the most likely, not guaranteed, but the most likely to have some ability to qualify for an exemption uh, through the ordinance that is uh, going to be brought forward, correct? That, that's what the technical committee be working on. I think w one of the focuses would certainly be Res, um, restaurant waste or other heavy waste, which is usually organic rich, and finding opportunities to move that into source separate organic stream as opposed to MSW. And, it, and, and at one point we want to make too is if it's a source separate organic subject to, to market, it can flow to the Kent County Bioenergy Facility because we're ready to handle it there. It doesn't have to. Um, and then in addition, if I'm also remember correctly, the waste uh, ordinance that uh, went through BPW and is coming to the board next uh, only requires depositing in a county facility, correct? It doesn't re outright require it has to go to one. Correct. It can go to the North Kent Transfer Station, Waste Energy, or the KCBF. So in, when you configure that third, a third, a third uh, um, formula for determining customer rates, for the 80% of households who already have their, their trash going to a county facility, um, really the only third that's going to impact their retail rate is the tip fee. Correct. Um, and then, uh, you know, you spoke already about how landfill, uh, landfill tipping fees are already increasing. Um, those increases uh, at the wholesale level, what are those attributed to beyond, you know, larger inflationary rates? Is it 
uh, having to uh, update facilities for leachate, PFAS mitigation, things like that? Certainly the impact to our facility has been around environmental impacts, including PFAS. Steve, I don't remember from the story if they detailed out all the reasons why. I don't want to, I just put you on the spot even though I didn't mean to. Uh, I mean, there's also inflationary uh, pressures and just, <clears throat> I think, the pen so there's only two times that we've seen uh, the volume of waste reduced where, where less tonnage came into our facilities. Uh, one was an economic recession and the other was a global pandemic, right. uh, which I don't advise as uh, solutions. Uh, so that being said, I think some of it was recalibrating after, uh, probably after some of those numbers went down or they didn't want to have those cost increases passed on. But ultimately, when we're talking about the, the, the decision before us, whether to pursue this new route or to continue with landfilling, um, landfills in themselves have their own costs. And even if they are, mar they are cheaper in the short term, we're seeing more and more of those pun slightly intended buried costs over time. And um, could you speak a little bit about how, given changes in state regulation, how those changes could also impact uh, uh, tipping fees should we not pursue this route and have to pursue another landfill? Well, the state, <clears throat> through its legislature and signed by the governor in, in December, actually uh, passed uh, a change in state statute. It's Public Act 451. It's Part 115. It's kind of the world we live in. And there, uh, through policy guidance and then the drafting of the legislation ultimately was, was approved, the state's looking to move its recycling rate uh, to, I think, 40 or 40, I think it's 45 percent over time. Uh, and the letter that we received that the Board of Commissioners also received, uh, the chair uh, indicated that the state is looking to, one, initiate the materials management process, no longer known as a solid waste management process, that they're looking to improve diversion and recycling rates, and they're looking to uh, lower the amount of material going to landfill. So when you look at the state statute, when you look at the materials management planning process, the conversations and the meetings and the the uh, information sessions that I've been a part of over the last number of years. Everything is pointing to wanting to reduce what's going to landfill, not status quo and not increasing it. And ultimately that could mean that state regulators could eat, uh, could, state regulators have a larger impact on this decision making, on this decision making process in the future. And a strategy that emphasizes diversion now may ultimately uh, prevent us from having to pursue something later uh, when it's mandated to us by the state. I would agree with that. I mean, it's a process and, and our planning committee would have to be seated and we would go through almost identically what we've been through the last eight years. We were just a bit ahead of it, um, but anticipating, listening and watching the rest of the country and the conversations in the industry. So I think we're well positioned uh, to make a decision that it influences it sooner versus later. So I guess as, as I'm thinking about this, you know, over the last few years, we have found new dis newly discovered expenses that we have to take into account for when it comes to, to leachate and groundwater contamination. Um, we have that, um, and then we also have a state regulatory consideration too, that all of those come with costs. And when I'm thinking about uh, my own budgeting and when I'm thinking about costs themselves, if I know something's buried, I'm gonna wanna unbury it pretty quickly and put that into my budget as soon as possible so that I can spread it out over time. And, uh, you know, ultimately, I, uh, I worry that a decision not to pursue this will come at a cost later on. It's just a cost that will come in a larger amount and uh, um, also, you know, come with unpredicted uh, consequences. Um, my last question, because I've heard some people uh, ask, well, could a slightly reduced option be, be available, you know, maybe a smaller facility with some landfilling, um, and could that decrease our, our overall cost? And my assumption, and I'm, I'm wondering if I'm right here, is the, our major cost is this mixed waste processing center. And I, given that that is a capital expenditure, I, I got to assume there's an economies of scale where the cost to build this is going to be very similar whether it's a larger system or a smaller system and uh, um, you know having a slightly reduced model may not necessarily come with a terrible reduction in, in cost to the county and ultimately given even if we have the mixed waste processing center 
our ability to put it to use is based on the anchor tenant, which through the RFP discovered, we need a certain amount of tonnage going to that tenant for it to work. That, if I, if I understand correctly, that's partly why it was sized in this way, that there's an economies of scale issue that if it was reduced, it wouldn't necessarily come at a huge cost delta. And two, there is still the need to reach that, that amount of tonnage to, to make this work. It really is all the above. So if I can share a few examples, the experience during this process, and then we also looked at waste energy. One of the questions was asked, well, why don't you just expand waste energy? And, and, it, and we anticipated that. In fact, in 2018, uh, we actually did a study on waste energy facility and determined, and so this is pre-pandemic inflation and interest rate impacts that, that we all are affected by today, that to expand the waste energy facility to just meet the amount of trash that we're transferring out there because we're actually over capacity was about $120 million. And that would be a cost borne by Kent County and the, through the DPW. Um, and, that, and that was, I think, adding another 500, almost 600 tons per day. And I don't want to do math publicly here, but you just multiply that out by 365. And, it, and, it, and so it addresses the Metro 6, but it doesn't take care of the rest of the county. And then it's back to the issue is you, you still have the difference in tip fee and the added cost of that facility because you have to finance the 120 million. So the tip fee goes up at Waste Energy and nowhere else. That was one option. Then we looked at, well, why don't we um, just add a bigger combustion unit at the waste energy facility for like 160 million. But it didn't again address the entire county need that 600,000 plus or minus of the municipal solid waste that's currently in our system. So that was even a larger number that the county would have to pick up at 160 million. Uh, if, if for those uh, history buffs, the uh, present day equivalent of what we bonded in the late 80s to build a waste energy facility was $160 million at a tip fee of $90 in 1990. Just to give you that. These mixed waste processing facilities are usually built in 200,000 ton modules. So you kind of go from two to four to six. So we knew that at 200,000 tons, while the cost might be less, it still didn't meet the processing needs. We weren't even building it large enough to meet our existing need. At 400,000 tons, it meets the existing need, but we designed the plant so it could, with a, with a few pieces of additional equipment and with a second shift, you can move from 400,000 to 600,000 with the understanding that someday Kent County will grow. But if Kent County doesn't grow, we also know that at some point the waste energy facility will reach its conclusion. No, probably no later than 2039, because that's our power purchase agreement with Consumers Energy. But likely, probably within the next 15 years, that facility will have met its, its goal. It would have met the needs of the community. And we'll have to be prepared to take the tonnage going there to move it somewhere else. The bioenergy facility today, as constructed, can do that in the future. If I may, Chair Stack. Um, the other consequence, I, I, you mentioned waste to energy. Uh, if I understand correctly, the, the current uh, agreement for waste to energy expires in two years? Expires December of 2025. Uh, and uh, it's, there's been signals from um, course, uh, our core six municipalities that without some degree of rate equity or some degree of, of countywide fairness uh, in our waste management, um, that that agreement may not be continued. And so without this choice, not only are we pursuing a South Kent landfill or a new South Kent landfill, but is it possible that we'd have to expand the footprint to accommodate trash that is currently going to the to waste energy? We'd either have to expand the footprint of the south of the new South Kent landfill 2.0, and or move more of that to neighboring landfills. Uh, Steve and I spent some time looking at what that future state could look like. We're at about a 20 28 percent diversion rate right now between our recycling facility and our waste energy facility. If you lost the waste energy facility, our diversion rate would drop to about 5%, meaning the rest of it would begin to go to landfill. At a time when the state legislature and the governor and, and, and the state as a whole is signaling that they'd like to see us move to a 45% rate diver, you know, diversion rate. So 
to not do something like this really sets us on a very different trajectory. Uh, we would do our best to manage through it, but we, but we know the reality is when you have 800 trucks delivering daily to your facilities and you have 600,000 tons of municipal solid waste hitting somewhere either in our community or going to a landfill near us, the solution has to be large enough to solve that. So a 200,000 ton facility doesn't meet that need. A 400,000 ton facility does. And again, until you process, until you take this material that we've all mixed together and separate it out, there's no value there other than sending it to waste to energy, which we've determined isn't a good forward-looking future. One last thing on waste to energy. If, if, if let's say everyone made a decision, let's just build a large waste to energy facility. Let's build like a 300,000, or excuse me, a 3,000 ton per day facility, meets our needs. The permitting process is probably 10 years if in fact you can even get a Title V permit um, because the industry as a whole is beginning to shrink and it's our understanding through our consultants is it would be a 10 year path to be permitted. So your solution would be 10 years plus another three or four. So you're almost 15 years out on a solution. Thank you. Commissioner Packlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you all for being here. It's Great to see you for, I think, the third time in this past week. So. Um, Dar, I know you talk a lot about uh, the amount of material that's buried in our landfills, and you have a great visual. Um, I, I'll spare the rest of us from hearing that visual again, but I'm, I'm curious. You, you, you can pull it up, I guess. Um, do you have any estimation on the, the value of the stuff that's buried in our landfill? Not the size or not how many aircraft carriers it can make, but the value of the stuff that we're literally just throwing out the door and burying. So I'll use two different stats, not what's buried there, but uh, I'll share our waste energy facility has processed 5 million tons of trash since 1990. We have a little over 7 million tons of trash buried at the South Kent landfill. We are able to capture scrap steel, metal, on the back end of our waste energy facility after the processing. Over the course of 33 years, just from the Metro Six Cities, we've been able to recapture 145,000 tons of scrap steel which, um, depending on who you're talking to in our department, it's either two Mackinac bridges or it's two U.S. Gerald R. Ford aircraft carriers because we have a Navy guy and he always uses the aircraft carrier example to my, to my chagrin. That's, that's one example. Um, the other example is that over the course of 25 years, we've estimated that about a million, excuse me, yeah, one million tons of recyclables can be recaptured that's in the trash today. It's the, it's the recyclables that don't make it in, that does not make it into the right cart today. Based on, I think, a 10-year average, I want to make sure I'm looking at Steve Simmons, a 10-year average of recycle, uh, of commodity rates, that equates to about $300 million of value. So I think that's how I would answer the question looking forward as opposed to looking back. Yeah, I think that's useful. Um, we, we heard a little bit from Steve Simmons, and he just sort of glanced over a little bit of his qualifications that he was a former engineer. I'm wondering if either Steve or you can talk a little bit about the technical qualifications of GBB and Steve Simmons as an expert in this project, um, and maybe give us some insight into some of the other experts that have been a part of the process. So if I can speak to the experts that have been a part of the process, but I'll let Steve speak for he and his company. One of the things that was mission critical to this, and we learned that early on, and sometimes you don't know what you don't know and you learn as you go, um, is that this was not just about landfilling. This wasn't just about environmental. This was about fiscal, it was about finances, about economic impact, it's about um, land use, it's about so many of those things. So we very early on brought in uh, industry, uh, both waste industry and non-waste industry, but those that generate waste or are in the recycling space. But more than that, we asked Plant Miranda to come alongside of us to do the financial analysis. We asked GBB to come alongside as our consultant in the solid waste, the right place, Lakeshore Advantage, uh, the Kent County Road Commission, Elgin County Road Commission, uh, of course, Door Township. Uh, we had the, the advisory committee that, that uh, Al so kindly uh, shepherded that again brought a lot of municipal perspective. Um, we toured, I think, was it 10 or 12 different facilities, you know, five or six different states. Uh, we asked uh, the Sustainable Research Group at the time to come along. Uh, there were so many different perspectives that helped us thumb wrestle and wrestle this thing down and kind of check us to make sure that we were thinking 
correctly about it. And then, of course, the likes of, of Warner Norcross Chud and Varnum and others that have helped advise us on the contracts and making sure that we do that right. So in my mind, I think we've, we've tried really hard to make sure that it, uh, we didn't get groupthink and we didn't box ourselves in and it wasn't a DPW effort. It was a, a much broader effort. But I'll ask Steve to mention a little bit more on the technical side of the project because he is the engineer in the room. <clears throat> Thank you. I wasn't expecting that question, but uh, per personally, uh, being a you know a, a young kid in the energy crisis of the '70s, you know, my I came out of college focused on energy, and or ultimately waste materials. And you know, in 1981, my first job, I went to the Oak Ridge National Labs to work on fusion reactors, and we're still trying to get fusion reactors going, right? But um, my career has been at the nexus of energy and solid waste really. Uh, in this, in my career pathway, I, I spent many years with a company that was the per acquired ultimately by Covanta, the person who just left your uh, waste energy operator. And in there I've developed, I've built, I've operated as a P&L manager, solid waste processing facilities. So that's the value I bring to DAR and the DPW team. I've done this really from all sides of the table, most of it truly over on the private sector side, trying to think how do I make money at, at this. But um, in our practice, our consulting practice, when I'm working in the practice, I do technology. You know, I talked earlier about we took the team on 12 tours. That's not the limit of tours that I took in that time. And, uh, you know, I'm out constantly testing technologies, looking at it, and that's what I bring to my clients that I consult for within our practice. Great, thank you. I've got two more quick ones, if, if it's all right, Mr. Chair. Um, just following up on some other comments we've heard, uh, I know Commissioner Sparks brought up the question about impact from the tip fee, and then Commissioner Wooden brought up some um, thoughts about the cost to landfilling and the uncertainty there. Am I correct in remembering, remembering that PFAS is either about to be or, or soon expected to be declared a hazardous substance by the EPA? Certainly EPA is looking at it. I'm not sure where that'll end up. There's, there's lobbying for and against. Um, but PFAS is, uh, is being considered that it may go hazardous based on definition by the US EPA. Uh, two years ago, maybe three already, we installed a PFAS pretreatment plant at the North Kent Transfer Station uh, we've been notified by the city of Wyoming that we'll have to do the same at the South Kent landfill. We've also installed uh, PFAS pretreatment at the waste energy facility. It's a real thing. We've spent uh, several million dollars of capex, and then of course ongoing operational costs. So it's not it's not going away. It's an additional cost. Uh, we look to the Eagle and to the EPA ultimately for those regs. But uh, to your point, it has been proposed by EPA that it would become hazardous. And thinking about your crystal ball that I know you carry with you everywhere, um, the impact of that to the cost of landfilling would be not status quo, right? It would be an increase of, of the cost of landfilling. If, if that were to happen from the hazardous declaration perspective, if we discovered more um, substances that we know were uh, coming out of our landfilling process, that would be the case that our landfilling costs would go up. It would, you know, when we monitor the groundwater and we build and install the, the landfill liner systems and we put in the leachate collection, it's all designed around what's actually in the leachate, right? The storm water that mixes with trash and then you have to send it out for wastewater treatment. Uh, all those constituents have to be dealt with either at pre-treatment or at the treatment facility itself. The reason why we treat out for PFAS is because the wastewater treatment plants don't have the capacity to do that. So we test our leachate, I think, on a quarterly basis, if not more often, groundwater and stormwater uh, equally as much. And if any of those constituents come up, whether it be a PFAS or a toluene or uh, what's in gasoline or a pesticide or any <coughs> other heavy metal, um, we have to address and treat that. And so PFAS is just one of those issues. Yeah, thank you. I think my final question is, um, 
uh, Commissioner Bujak brought up the question of flow control um, and some alternatives to what might be a countywide system. I, I know that having seen the draft ordinance, I know that there is flexibility built into the system for certain characterizations of trash uh, or of, of waste that are not well qualified to go into our system. Wondering if you could talk about some of the other qualifications that might be there that we would allow for exemptions. I'm thinking, for instance, where transportation costs would be insurmountable to get to one of our drop-off facilities, where we've got some border um, routes that would go into Allegan County or go into Nuevo on other ends. Yeah, I think you've, you've spoke well to them. Certainly, we're all about collaboration being practical, right? Because at the end of the day, you're trying to deliver the best product at the lowest cost that meets all of your goals. And, and economics is certainly one of them. And uh, I, I spent a lot of years in the private sector, just as Steve did, and you know, ran two businesses. And um, and, and very familiar with bottom line P&L uh, is you know for this facility or for this operation and past private uh, Our goal is to be as flexible a as we are with waste energy where it can happen a number of different ways We may find something that we don't want and so we notify the hauler and the customer The customer may have something and so they can trigger it. So that's two different ways or the hauler may recognize that there's a challenge so there's three different pathways of making a determination of should this material be exempted. I can't speak to every scenario. I just know that Waste to Energy is in its 33rd year of operation and we have a very robust system that we go through the exemptions, we see things from time to time, we inspect every 10th load. We physically inspect every 10th load every day to make sure that what's coming in is appropriate and that if it needs to go somewhere else, it ought to. Commissioner Hildebrand. Thank you, Chair Sack. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I um, conceptually think, you know, this is the right direction long term. I think the difference of opinion is, you know, if we're ready. Um, and I know you guys have been working on this for many, many years, and I'm brand new on the board, so I'm just getting up to speed on everything. But I think uh, that's one of my concerns, if we're ready to put all our eggs in that basket right now or not. Um, you know, I. It's probably not the best comparison, but you know the auto industry is going to electric vehicles. You know they just didn't shut off their internal combustion engine plants. They, you know they're phasing in, and uh, so I've been curious about a, a phase-in option. I know a smaller landfill is of concern um, for you guys, but um, I've kind of thrown out there a, a concept of a of a phased-in approach to this, and um, I have uh, I guess two concerns other than if the time is right to put all our eggs in that basket. The other is just a general debt concern on the bond of the county, and that's not just your project. Um, it's um, questions about what our capacity is. Um, I don't, I, we don't need to answer this today, but um, I'm gonna be digging into our, our legal capacity, what our commitments and liabilities are now, and what this would kind of add to that liability. Um, I think um, the people I represent are concerned about debt and what we'd be incurring from that standpoint. The second thing, and probably more importantly, is um, dealing with um, the cost to consumers long term. And I, as board members, I don't think we can control that. I mean, the tipping fee is, you know, put on the haulers who then have to figure out their business model and if they pass along the cost to the to the customers to make their businesses work. So for me to get more comfortable with this, I've got to figure out a way that we have some kind of guarantee that in year two or three or four down the road, if some reason the finances get challenging or upside down, we just don't say, okay, we gotta raise the tipping fees. And because we've already mandated to these waste haulers, they're bringing their trash there. Um, and to make our finances work, we just are gonna raise their tipping fee and then they're just gonna have to pass the cost along to our, to our constituents. So. Somehow we have to figure out there's some guarantee that we're not just going to pass costs. There's a lot of unknowns with this project going forward. Somehow there's got to be a guarantee that we're not just going to fix the problem by increasing tipping fees. And then we have no control as elected board members on the cost passed on to our constituents. So I hope we can come up with something um, because I need to go back if we go you know, this is coming pretty quickly. And if we, I need to go back to the people I represent and say, we've got some cost controls in here for you. Uh, some, you know, some rate 
guarantees, if you will, um, that your rates aren't going to go up. Um, or some checks and balances where it has to come before the finance committee or the full board if we have to go down that road, road so it's very public um, about what we're doing. So. Thank you. Uh, so there's two questions there. The first is, um, are we putting all our eggs in one basket? I, I would suggest that we're doing absolutely the opposite. We're actually expanding our fleet of facilities. And we're, not, we're implementing this over time, right? It's a three-year build. Our South Kent landfill has seven years of runway left. There are landfills outside of Kent County that can and will continue to take trash. We haven't taken the landfill option away. We have simply stated that we don't think it's in Kent County's best interest based on where the state is going and based on, I think, our philosophical approach to how we manage municipal solid waste, that we be in the, long, the landfill business long term. The other issue that I think I would speak to is that Sustainable Business Park is a, is a place, the Kent County Bioenergy Facility is a facility. And so we'll have waste to energy, we'll have our North Kent Transfer Station, we have our recycling center, we'll have our bioenergy facility, we'll have a fleet of four facilities. We're actually expanding the fleet, not contracting it. So we're not putting all our eggs in one basket. We still have a transfer station. If we have to move to landfill for some reason, we will. Waste to energy facility was down this past weekend, but nobody knew it. Trash didn't pile up anywhere. There's nothing on Calder Plaza. Your trash was picked up. Why? Because after 33 years of, of operating the waste energy facility, we had to replace the cranes. And for safety, we had to shut down the tipping floor from Friday to Monday. We reworked and worked with the haulers and that, that the entire system continued to work. We mass balance from the transfer station. We mass balance off the waste energy facility that also has a transfer station. The bioenergy facility as proposed will have a transfer station built into it. So that flexibility is there. So in my mind, we aren't putting our eggs in one basket at all. We're, we're actually expanding our fleet. We're giving ourselves more options. We're providing an organic uh, processing facility that, that so many companies are communicating to us that they need an outlet for food that's expired or a container that didn't get filled properly or, or whatever the reason. Uh, there, there's so much food waste out there from our processors and from agriculture and other places that this material can now go to if we were to build it. I think on, on the issue of do we build another landfill, if you build a 10 acre, 50 acre, 100 acre, 500 acre landfill, you've developed the same amount of liability. So could we build a small landfill? Yes, but why would we when there's, I, th I forget what Steve spoke to, 30 or 40 acre years of landfill capacity in five facilities outside of Kent County. To me, having that capacity nearby, the industry certainly will still meet that need. I just don't know that the county needs to continue to be in the landfill business because our, de our department manages two Superfund sites, they're landfills. We, we manage a closed landfill in North Kent, trans, or North Kent Landfill in Plainfield. And landfill operations, in my mind, it's, it's, there's no question, it's the low cost today solution. But we will all live those realities in the future and we're living those realities today. We have an unfunded liability from Kentwood and the Sparta landfill. We have consent decrees with the US EPA because they're Superfund sites to uh, Commissioner Patchla's comment. Um, and then the issue of, of, of do you ease in or do you not ease in? It was, it was telling to me when we started this process in 2015, we didn't know kind of, kind of where, where or when we would land. But eight years later, we're bringing a proposal forward to the Board of Commissioners for consideration. In my mind, it took too long. But when I look back at it, I go, but we had to go through all of this work to be able to deliver the best informed project possible, even though eight years, you know, I've got kids married and two new grandkids and just all kinds of things happened during that time, right? Um, but then we went back to the waste to energy facility and said, well, how long did that take? The conversation about waste to energy started in 1975. And that facility was ultimately built in 1990. And, and, and it was built in, you know, I think they started in 87. But the decisions to move forward was in 85. Um, so it, it ought to take a day or two or three to take on a facility or, or a approach like this. 
I don't think we've been rushed. I don't think that we've not done our due diligence. But if not this, I've heard not this, not now. Well, to me, after all the hard work we've done, it'll be up to the Board of Commissioners to make the decision, right? Our goal is to try to share with you what we're seeing. This is what we're seeing across our fleet of facilities. This is where we're at as a community. This is where we think the state and the feds are going. And this is the history of our department and why we do what we do. Um, I think we've done the due diligence. I think we've taken the time. Um, should a project like this not move forward, I, I think we're just facing down a situation where uh, more and more will actually go to landfill and less and less will be recovered. Um, and then we'll just have to make decision if, you know, if is that the right thing to do or is there a, other things that we can do along with it? So maybe I've kind of exhausted that, but just thought I'd speak to it a little bit. Commissioner DeBoer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Dar and Steve, thank you so much for all your work. You've done a phenomenal job, and um, I do have a lot of concerns with this. And some of my concerns are more of my personal convictions and my personal beliefs. Um, but I wanted to give you guys the respect of kind of just sharing why I'm going to likely be voting no on this. Um, so for me, when I hear a blanket statement that we're going to make it equitable for all, when not all is equitable in the trash in trash to begin with. I mean, for, for what I've seen in the rural areas, you know, they don't throw away much organics compared to other, you know, maybe the city. We've got livestock, we've got gardens, you know, and I've, I've seen this, um, I've seen this almost dichotomy arise, which I'm very uncomfortable with, and, and Dave kind of hit on this a little bit too, is that if we don't do this, then we're going to have to dig another landfill, where I think there could be some other approach in between those two or something that eases into this solution, because it is a good desire. It is, we all want to be sustainable. We do want to engage some of these discussions and try to be more responsible. Um, I also fear that when we do talk about all of this, we are taking away the personal responsibility and we are putting it on the government to provide a solution, which isn't always a bad thing, but at the same time, when we take away that personal responsibility, I feel like we're incentivizing bad behavior due to the private market has a way, due to money. Um, and for me, you know, I have a neighbor a couple um, houses down. He has a huge um, trash area in his backyard. We've got acreage, you know, and so he just burns it every year. And I, I guarantee you he will not be purchasing or, or buying trash service. He'll be probably burning all of the plastics and making the air more toxic. People are going to, I've got 10 acres. I could, if I wanted to, if I don't feel that I have personal, responsibil personal responsibility to, to be sustainable, I could dig a hole and I could throw my trash in there if I really desire to. Um, I also have an uh, issue with the flow control with small businesses. I mean, I have a small business. If you have more money in, in expense, uh, more in expenses, that has to be somehow, you know, you have to get, have the revenue for that. And the only revenue stream really that these trash haulers have is their customers. So I do believe that it's going to roll over mostly to the customers. And, you know, the numbers between the two of you guys are between the chamber and um, DPW are quite different. So, I mean, both can't be true, so I'm just wondering, maybe maybe neither are true and it's in between. Um, I also, you know, I, I don't believe necessarily that this sustainable business park or the bioenergy facility is a good business model um, because I, I, I'm, this is my frame of reference. I come from small business, so I, I wonder why do the six cities went out of this um, if it's not producing the desired results for them? It, I feel like they should be saying, hey, townships, come on board, instead of we want to be like the townships, if the community really desired to have this initiative brought forward right now. And again, I think it's a good desire. I like you both as people. You guys are wonderful people. But those are my concerns, and I just wanted to give you the respect of my thoughts and just kind of share where I'm at. Um, I also, to uh, the bond issue is kind of hard for me, and I, I, the eggs in the basket, I feel like we're putting a lot of eggs in energy as basket. So, um, just for me, I, I mean, I really do want to work with you guys and try to figure out a good um, way that we can further becoming more sustainable as a community. But for me, this, this one, I will likely not be supporting it. Would it be okay to address a sure. couple? Because I think there was some questions sure. in there too. So th three things that I would just ask that you consider. First of all, the bonding is to, is to pay for 
Kent County owned infrastructure. Energy is putting its dollars in. That's their private investment to run the business, to the, run the bioenergy facility. The second thing is, is when I became director, I took a step back and said, how do we get here? That was 2015, 16. And so we actually did it, and we have a presentation on this. Back in the late 1800s, the Army Corps of Engineers stated that so much garbage was being thrown away in the Grand River that it had become a navigation hazard. I don't know why we don't still do that, but we don't. Then um, the piggery concept was born where we fed our trash to the pigs, except for they tasted so bad they couldn't sell them as livestock, so they stopped doing that. Then this idea of dumps came into place. In fact, in 1965, the, the Board of Commissioners, or Board of Supervisors back then, asked the Chicago engineering firm to come in and, and make a determination on what is going on in Kent County. They discovered we had 29 unlicensed, unregulated dumps. And that's why the Kent County Refuse Disposal System occurs, you know, is, was established today. Well, then we said the sanitary landfill is the right way to go. So, you know, we took over two dumps, and they're now called Superfund sites in Sparta and Kentwood. Then we opened the North Kent landfill, and we filled that one up and closed it and moved the South Kent landfill, and now we're about to fill that one up and close it. I think the perspective I would offer is that when we look at uh, wastewater districts, um, whether it's the City of Grand Rapids, North Kent Sewer Authority, whoever might be providing service in your area, there's not four sanitary pipes and three water lines in your in the ground there's one and the reason is there's a reason why that public infrastructure is invested in because the cost of maintaining and operating that is better when you're having when you have one provider not multiple and so there's that balance between of course private and public sector there's a reason why in my opinion the state of michigan has more trash buried per resident than anywhere else in the country and that is because in our state the industry operates most of the landfills so you have landfill operators that are more than happy to take trash from the east coast take trash from toronto toronto banned landfills that's why all the trash uh, ontario that's why all the trash comes to michigan and so i'm not convinced that the public sector or the private sector makes the best decisions until they come together and in my mind, I think we've really proved out an opportunity where the both are really coming together. Are we the villain because we generate refuse? Is the landfill the villain? I don't know. I just know that uh, I think we've been able to put together a, a program that moves the county toward managing future opportunity instead of managing future. Well, thank you for that. Commissioner Hennessy. Never mind. Pass. Commissioner Legrand. Chair, um, Commissioner Hennessy uh, asked me to ask the question if she was, I think she had to use the restroom. Into so, the line. Yeah. Commissioner, <laughs> Commissioner Legrand. Okay. So she, you, if you can come back to her, I think she's yeah. still here. So. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm just wondering, is there any room for financial incentive? I, we talked about the um, source separated organics. If... Um, obviously restaurants or schools or whoever is generating a lot of it, but if a municipality were to, you know, offer an organic uh, bin or whatever, would that, would there be any saving for that or a township or whoever, like, or a private hauler just said, I'm just going to haul organics. It's, it's cheaper. We can go to this door instead of the, the main door. Is there any room for financial incentive there? Would there be a savings? I think you can look at it a couple different ways. One is, there are waste haulers that have approached us and said they see a new business model here, the ability to pick up large scale amounts of organic, whether it's in tanker form or on a pallet or in a dumpster, and move that into the source separated door, if you will, at the bioenergy facility at a market rate. So I think there is new opportunity there. Certainly there's always always has to be consideration around transportation. Anytime you add another cart or add another truck, right, you've got another route. Uh, an additional you know, trucking impact. So I never want to discount that. But I think there is real opportunity here for companies. I mean, we receive calls from companies weekly that want to use our waste energy facility because they have sustainability goals and they don't want to go to landfill, but we can't offer it to them. 
our sense is that based on what energy has shared with us, what the right place has been working on, the number of companies in West Michigan that process food, there's significant opportunity to be able to deliver that type of material to this facility. There's been question um, on can we, can we do something cheaper, can we do something different, can we do something smaller scale? One of the things we looked at um, was our recycling rate, our residential recycling rate, and we can point, we, I spent an hour explaining why, is at about 25%. And we've been stuck at 25% for quite some time, and we don't see it improving or increasing. One of the things that we talked about is could you have a combined rate where you, if you subscribe for trash service, your recycling cart comes with it. That may help. Um, but then we did some analysis on that as well because we know that we're missing all of the commercial material. If, if we set a goal, which I think would be phenomenal, to go from 25% to 50% recycling rate residential, right, that's a huge leap. That'd be from 25,000 tons diverted to 50,000 tons diverted because everyone's using the right cart when they put their recyclables in it. It would only change our diversion by 4% countywide because we're missing all the commercial. And, and, and so trying to find these solutions that are tweeners, I'll help. But it doesn't deal with the 800 trucks a day that are delivering trash to one of our facilities. It's those 800 trucks that we're trying to address. And so that's, that's what we think about when we think about the new opportunities. Waste energy provides opportunity. We just are maxed out and we can't do that. Our recycling center takes in seven or 8,000 tons of recyclables from outside of Kent County. We service Muskegon, Ottawa, Mount Calm, um, Iago, Ionia, uh, uh, Allegan County. So, you know, we, we meet the needs of a, a larger area with that facility. And the bioenergy facility can do the same. Um, we'll, we'll do the economic impact analysis, but we believe that built out, there's probably a billion dollars worth of new investment that can come to West Michigan focused on what we're trying to accomplish here. And here's the other thing that we haven't spoke a lot to is our recycling facility, we move commodities every day, right? The, the plastics and the metals and the glass and all those things, they all move out of the West Michigan market, all of it. Aluminum goes to Gottlieb, Pennsylvania, I think it is. Our glass goes to Wisconsin. Our paper goes to Indiana and Ohio. Um, our plastics go to Ontario and to the east side of the state. We have companies that are talking to us right now that want to put these facilities here at this business park so our recyclables can stay here and they can process it and do bigger and better things in Kent County in West Michigan than in Ontario or Wisconsin or Indiana or wherever. Else. I'm just wondering if the, the low hanging fruit of just separating out the organics would have an impact and if that's you know well it certainly could because then i think i think of a school cafeteria schools overall i think are very organic rich it's kind of a weird term but it's something i've learned it has there's a lot of paper mm -hmm. um paper towel cafeteria food waste and those types of things and if it's organic rich enough and there's some other stuff mixed in, so it's like 80-20, it's 80% organics, 20% other stuff. It goes through the source separated door. I showed you that picture early on yeah. that you can't really tell the difference. That's source separated organics. Now, if it's 80-20 the other way, then it has to go through a different door because you've decided to throw everything else in with your organics. Um, which is, I think what's so resilient about this program is it, it does, it's, you know, it's both and. It's, we can take both, we can take either. Um, and you can charge accordingly, depending on how much you want to sort out. Thank you. All right, now we'll go to Commissioner Hennessy. Thank you. <clears throat> Looking at your timeline, the first decision point is two weeks. Out, which, sketch out for me what the, it is that we will be seeing officially on that date. Well, I would start, the, I'll start the comment by 
Our department would never suggest flow control if it were a pathway to putting more in the landfill. I think in the past we've looked at flow control as a solution for a lot of things except for maybe diversion. So in our mind, flow control is designed around municipal solid waste. It's what you and I put in our trash. It's what the office and the restaurant and, and the other businesses put in their dumpster that's behind the building. That's what we're addressing here is that 600,000 tons generated each year in Kent County. The flow control ordinance would be enacted in August if approved by the Board of Commissioners. It would be effective 30 days later and then it would uh, there'd be a future compliance date when we're ready to turn on these the new facility and begin to and continue to ensure that waste energy and the bioenergy facility can receive the feedstocks it needs to process that. There's an exemption process so if the company that generates the waste, the hauler that takes it, or we say, you know what, that's not the right stuff, we don't want that here, there's a way to exempt that out. Uh, there's an anticipation that there'll be a technical committee that's, that sits underneath the Board of Public Works that wrestles down and works through. That's gonna include the industry and a lot of others to help us work through and think through and talk through what's the best way to implement this. So it, while the decision would be made in August, it would be effective now. It's not, you don't comply until a date, certain date in the future, which is around 2026, which then allows us plenty of time to kind of work out a few of those last details. And some might suggest, well, you should do that right now. I guess I would share with you that our, the template that we've used so successfully is the waste to energy facility. There's a process and we use it and we use it effectively and we'll model after that. So we're not starting from ground zero. You know, we're starting at somewhere up here and then just need to tweak a couple things to be ready. So that will affect anybody who picks up, does trash pickup within Kent County? Correct. Whether they just, whether it, its end result is here, you're going to really basically, unless there's exemptions, require it to be deposited here. Um, like, you know, a waste hauler who has their own landfill someplace won't necessarily be allowed to use it? So, two things. First of all, 80% of the municipal solid waste today is delivered to a Kent County DPW facility, 80%. And then the second is a philosophical question. Is it the right thing to take that trash and bury it in a landfill? And when I say trash, all the recyclables and the organics that really could be captured and used in a different way. That's a philosophical question that I can't answer. If I could, you've had this committee meeting for a long period of time. How is, how is the idea of, you know, how you're going to be handling this flow control ordinance, how is that being received? Um, I would say it's mixed. I would say the industry as a whole is, is not happy with that. Um, because it changes where that material potentially could go. And it's been communicated to us that the industry's preference is to landfill it. I think that's a clear message. The industry's message is that they want to, they want to landfill. And that's a philosophical question. Right. Thank you. Commissioner or Vice Chair Breve. Thank you, Chair. This was um, kind of a question I think Commissioner Teal had before she left, and I know other commissioners have brought it up to me. Um, you know, beyond just looking at the fees for this, why do we continue to stay in the trash business? Why is it um, beneficial for Kent County residents? I guess what are the pluses and minuses? Because we could potentially just sell it off, sell off waste to energy, um, get rid of the recycling center, completely remove ourselves from the business. How is staying with it beneficial to the residents and our community? Thank you, Commissioner. And that's another philosophical question. And I would just ask that you look at our history. We were forward thinking and we stepped in in 1990 when Recycle Unlimited that started in the 1970s. I remember bringing my bottles to the DNW in Granville way back in the day. Um, they could no longer continue to operate. 
So for the last 33 years, we stepped into the gap and we have a state-of-the-art recycling facility that has the best technologies uh, and is operating efficiently and effectively for West Michigan. We had leadership who recognized that landfilling and the Byron Township in the South Kent landfill ought to be the last time the Kent County sites a landfill who saw waste energy as a solution. And so we've been able to avoid constructing an entirely new landfill uh, with that waste energy facility. We operate our safe meds program, which allows residents to bring medications in at no cost so it doesn't go into the wastewater or trash. We operate a safe sharps program that allows residents to bring in sharps and lancets and syringes to ensure that those don't become an issue. We operate uh, our safe homes program, including our household hazardous waste and safe chem program, where we take hundreds of thousands of pounds of very hazardous and toxic materials that you can buy, including pesticides. Um, crazy as it sounds, we've gotten um, old crazy chemist chemicals in and, and and, and we take as much of that material and we redistribute it and put it back on the shelf for residents that otherwise couldn't afford it, can pick up car care chemicals or laundry detergent or all those things at our redistribution center. We operate electronics recycling program that allows electronics uh, to be safely captured and recycled instead of throwing that away because there's precious metals, gold, silver, copper, and other things in those electronics that ought not to be landfilled. We operate uh, a recycling center that's been backstopped. So in a time when um, didn't want to charge more and we continue to be one of the lowest charging per ton facilities out there at $70 per ton, we'd love for it to be zero. But over a, a, an eight year period, we backed, no, I think maybe it was a nine year period, we used $8 million of our revenue from the South Kent landfill to backstop and ensure that not only Kent County, but West Michigan had a place to bring its recyclables at the lowest cost possible to keep that cost down to the residents. So we look at our function a bit differently, I think, than, than others do. I spent a lot of time in the private sector. I ran two businesses incredibly successfully, made the owner a multimillionaire, and it's all good. But our focus was our customer taking care of our customer. Our department's focus is taking care of the residents, the customers, businesses, and the health of Kent County. When we have companies, this whole, the genesis of all of this started in 2015 when we did a zero waste to landfill study with industry sponsored through the right place. And we said, what are you struggling with trying to find the right home for instead of landfilling? And they came up with this litany of things. That's where all this started. It actually started with industry. So when we look at what we've accomplished and what we do as a department every day, sure, you, you can make a philosophical decision that we ought not be in the business anymore. But I'll straight up ask, all the things that I've just mentioned, where does that go? And who backstops it? And does our community support that? And is that where we want to be as, as a county? I, I, we're meeting with Allegan County next week. I met with Ottawa County yesterday the sheer frustration that I hear from these other communities that don't have the resources, the understanding, and are getting pushed around by companies that all they want to do is landfill. And any, any other solution that you offer is basically, you're just straight up told that, you know, it doesn't fit our business model, we're not going to do it. I guess the other thing I would ask you to look at is, if you look at the, the West Michigan and Kent County region, and you ask yourself, where is the waste industry investing in recovery of materials? I don't see it. I do not see it. I see investment in landfill. I see very little investment on recovery side. And, and that's where we're trying to invest. And I think as a community, that's where we're suggesting we ought to go. All right. Um, if not, I, I have a few chair prerogative, I guess, to be last. So, Dar, as I understand, or any of the three presenters here, um, an option of business as usual, nice idea, we decided just to do nothing. That's not an option for us, is it? 
we don't see that as an option for the following reasons. It doesn't meet DPW's vision and mission. And so you can question, well, should that change? Well, we certainly could change it. It certainly does not track well with where the state of Michigan and the legislature and the statute is taking us in the future. If waste to energy is going to continue to be a successful facility for DPW, we need to continue to operate that. And we believe the best way to do that is to manage Kent County waste, not waste from outside the county. We certainly could become a merchant plant, meaning we could take in waste from companies across Michigan or even in the Midwest uh, if there's not enough waste being generated locally. In fact, we could probably take it in at a better rate and become very profitable and, 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 and run just a stellar uh, merchant, waste pro merchant waste program, as you would call it. But that's not what we're called to do as a department. That's not what our charge was by the Board of Commissioners when our refuse disposal system was set up. And then doesn't, I think our, you, doesn't our six city agreement it it lapses at the end of next year? It does lapse at the end of next so year. So we don't have any current solution for what happens after that right now. I think what the future looks like is that a certain amount of material would still be delivered there, but we would have to reduce the rate to near landfill disposal rates. And we know that the capital and operational cost of any facility like this, whether it's a bioenergy facility or the waste energy facility or the recycling center. Our recycling center costs more per ton to operate than a landfill does. Yeah, but that tells me that if we do nothing, the six city agreement goes away, this waste to energy facility is at risk. I would agree with that statement. Okay. Um, if we do nothing, um, the current landfilling will max out and we'll be left with no landfill. So we have to do something to deal with that million dollar or million tons of trash. We either build out a new landfill in, in Door Township or frankly, we start pursuing, well, and I say we would do that anyway. If we start building out new landfill capacity in Door Township, within five years of, of opening the South Kent landfill, we started looking for more property for the next one. I think the next one should be reasonably thought about being in Northern Kent County somewhere. I mean, wherever it goes, we have, to start, it goes. We have or, to start planning for a new landfill soon. If we're going to support our department and what we do, the landfill supports the operation of our facility because of the profitability that it offers. Okay. So I've heard some questions about, um, uh, it, isn't there a better plan out there? I mean, I, okay, you spend eight years exhaustively looking and you retain the best consultant in the world, Mr. Simmons, um, to exhaustively look at that. But um, don't we have a secret, no risk, no cost, solution that is environmentally pure? When I was a kid, <laughs> way back when, well, I guess there was, a, a, there was a rumor that there was a carburetor that got bought up by the industry that was set on a shelf that could get 80 miles to the gallon. I think what we've tried to do, uh, Chair Stack, is we have two things. One is we're trying to show, we're trying to share with you what we see. The second thing is, is we're trying to under-promise and over-deliver. When we've built all of our financial modeling, it's incredibly conservative because we don't want to be that department and we refuse to do something that would be to a detriment of this great county. So although, and that's been our history as a department, we've successfully operated a recycling center and we've completely refurbished it in the last 10 years since it's been built and it's state of the art. We're building a brand new transfer station and paying cash for it. We're refurbishing the waste energy facility so it has a, a path for the next 20 years. We're signaling that there's an issue and that we're seeing that at some point South Kent landfill will be full and we need to, to take action on that. And that's been the history of our department is thinking forward. So we're doing our very best to share with you the best approaches that we've discovered over the last eight years, not sitting in group think, but bringing in and, and, and looking at facilities from around the country and listening to companies that operate around the world. And we believe that we're delivering the best solution in this time for this county. I guess that's, that's a little bit what I'm hearing uh, maybe percolating out there is you just haven't found it yet, that there really must be some great project out there that, that, that you just didn't get yet. And 
Well, there, there's um, two, so there's two things. There's two things that you have to address, and we've recognized this early on. Have to be able to meet the needs of the 800 plus trucks delivering to your facilities every day. I think I dropped the second one. Sorry. Um, oh, and you have to build a facility large enough to be able to separate everything. I mean, the alternative is is let's have seven bins at home and seven different trucks go to your go down to your house and pick everything up separately. Then you've solved the problem. Then, then, you, then you've solved the sortation problem, but you've created a whole nother set of issues around diesel fuel burn and trucks going down the road and safety issues and wear and tear on the roads and the cost. We know that costs $1.70 a minute to move a truck here in Kent County with trash on it at 100 bucks an hour, truck and driver. So you can approach it the european model is separate it all out glass goes here then plastic then this then this and this and this and do it that way here we're saying we're going to give you the absolute best in convenience and, and capacity and capability you don't have to sort it out actually you can we have a recycling center we'll take it there yeah. um, you can sort out your organics if you choose to and we have a, an organics door where you can send that organics directly to but if for whatever reason and there's a host of them that it doesn't make sense for you to separate out your trash at home. Just bring it to the curb and we'll ensure that at least 50% of that is recycled on day one when that facility opens. So is it, it, does it remain your sense and our consultant's sense that this is the best, inner, this is the best strategy, this is the best technology, the best system to address what we want to do? It is, and I'll have Steve answer it too. The, the, what we've done is take two technologies and we're just co-locating them. Mixed waste processing is real and it happens and it's going on right now. And there's companies like WM and others, Republic, that operate those kind of facilities in this country right now. And there's companies that operate anaerobic digestion systems what we just chosen to do is let's just take the transportation out between moving it from point A to point B and co-locate them. They're just there side by side doing their thing, but it's back to you have to do that. And food waste is one of the largest organic streams in the waste stream that you have to address. Um, and you have to sort it and, and separate it and fraction it out before you can do anything. So I assume that there's some risk in doing this and there's risk with every strategy. Um, well, in, 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 this, in this case, uh, Energy is our partner, our proposed partner. Yes. Um, they're not a nonprofit. No. So, and they're proposing to invest $300 million. Correct. Uh, is it fair to assume that they're doing that because they think they can monetize it? I think it's very fair to think that. One of the things that we, we attempted to do when we looked at, it's back to my comment about waste energy. When the Board of Commissioners back in, 1985 made a decision to move forward with waste energy. They bonded the equivalent of $160 million in today's dollars. We're trying to deliver something that processes twice as much with more optionality for around 80 to 90 million with, of, the, of the county's investment 33 years later. It'll process 400,000 tons up to 600,000 tons, not 200. Yeah. The investment is 80 to 90 million, not 160 million. And it's a public-private collaborative effort, not just the county going alone. That's always been our goal is to bring in the companies with the technologies. We know the trash business. We don't know anaerobic digestion. But, but they've done it, and they've done it around the world. They've done it around the world. And they do it, uh, presumably, to make a profit. They do. And they do make a profit. If they make a profit in our arrangement, um, is there? A, you haven't talked much about that. Is there a, share, a revenue share, a net revenue share agreement? There is a, a revenue share agreement. We looked at de-risking the project first because that's always the question that gets asked first: is how risky is this? The ability to pay the operations and pay the bonds is built on the tipping fee, because it should be. But on the back end, for every MMBTU of energy that's created through natural gas, we get paid a dollar. For every ton of recycling that comes off the back end of that plant, we receive 75% of the value. 
And that's additive. Now we drive that back right back in to, again, keep the cost as low as possible, but we built it around the tip fee, but there is revenue share built into this so that the more organic material, for example, that's merchant that Energia brings in the side door, the more gas they generate, the more benefit that we receive financially. So the more successful they are, the less cost of the system because it has an income put into it. That's correct, because we've always done what we call a rate study. We sit down with our board of commissioners every year. We look at every one of our facilities and say, what does it cost to do this operation? What are all of our non-tip fee revenues? Okay, let's use those first. What's left? That's our tip fee. So we use commodity value. We, we use the $8 million of electricity we sell to consumers' energy every year. We use all those different triggers. Uh, renewable energy credits and carbon credits and all those things, they're not profit to us. We drive that right back into the business so they can reduce our cost of doing business. But each of these dynamics, each of these conversations are about, I mean, I get it, there's a risk in any, um, any economic endeavor. You might make 10%, you might break even, you might lose a little bit, you might make a lot, uh, but to the extent that they're successful and they are on a track record, that reduces our cost and has potential for reducing the overall cost of the system. That's correct. Okay. If we look at a landfill, has a landfill ever generated return to us? No, it's short term. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they generate, they gen I mean, it helps offset some of the cost of our doing business. So if we, if we went the option of a landfill, uh, first of all, we have to buy one. We've got to find one and buy one, right? Got to buy the property. Yeah. Um, and... The dump I remember when I was a kid didn't cost anything just to back the truck up there and dump it, but the landfills of today cost a fair amount compared to that. That is correct. The and the landfills of tomorrow are probably going to cost us that much more again. Well, we're seeing the trending going up, yes. So in each time we have an environmental issue, the costs go up. That's true. Um, so I guess what I'm looking at is to the extent that we pursue the alternative of a landfill or another landfill, the only conversations you at the DPW or we at the county are going to have is how much more cost is it going to have to bear? We know that the, the fees and, and financial assurance that EGLE is requiring in the, under the new state statute has increased. And, and we know that PFAS and these other things are an issue. Um, and anytime you look at these facilities or look at these type of operations, environmental justice, and there's a whole host of other things, I don't, want to, I don't want to be here, that, I don't want to sit here and be the hater of landfills and, and, and call no, them No, I'm just looking at it from an economic the perspective. It's, right. just, it's a conversation about how much more cost are we going to have. Well, you externalize, yeah. you simply, as soon as you put something in your cart and you bring it to the landfill, you've externalized some of that cost to the community in a number of different ways. Whether you're driving by, you know, Mount whatever, South, Mount Southcat Landfill whether it's uh, mowing the property, whether it's monitoring the wells, whether it's pumping and treating the leachate or putting PFAS pretreatment in, uh, or all the other, you know, dealing with the stormwater, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, Kentwood Landfill, I became director in 15, 16? I think it was in 17. We, f we found out that um, landfill gas was migrating from the Kentwood Landfill sideways. It was going horizontal toward residents. We spent a million dollars correcting that problem, and it's not fixed yet. We're just managing the problem, but it was a million dollars that had to be spent to protect the residents and protect the city buildings for, for the city of Kentwood. Those are the type of things that crop up and jump up and bite you that you, you just don't know until you know. So we really can't, if we take the landfill approach, we really can't give our residents any assurances that costs won't continue to go up or that the next environmental contaminant isn't going to require incremental or substantially greater costs. I think you're seeing the state really begin to want to ratchet down on landfill operations, and they're communicating that through the statute, and within that statute, the financial assurance and the cost. Um, and we're seeing it, of course, because this, the wastewater treatment plants are requiring us, because the state's requiring them to treat out the PFAS before we discharge to them. So we are seeing increased costs, it's just reality. So there's no risk-free solution here. I don't see it as a no. I don't see landfill as no risk. Along with the approximately forty million dollars that you have to spend to design, permit, build. So it's forty million dollars to go into a new landfill estimated. 
Uh, that was a study that was completed by Golder Associates, which is a landfill design firm that we utilize to design and build our cells at the South Kent landfill. That was a two, I think it was a 2018 number. All right. Well, I usually when they ask questions, they generate more questions, so I, I'll stop there. Um, all I right, love trash talk. Let's go. Uh, yeah, it's 1230. I think uh, I've, I've probably exhausted our colleagues' uh, patience. So appreciate the presentation, the time. Uh, it's been a long haul. Um, we've been uh, working at this for some time, so we'll continue to focus it. And, and uh, if commissioners still have more questions, as they may, um, please reach out. We'll continue to try to answer those questions. Thank you, Chair Scott. All right, with that, we have public comment. Anyone from the public? Oh, DeAndre, I just knew you'd stick around for this. How are you doing, everybody? Identify yourself, and you have up to three minutes. I'm Dee Jones, international visionary and entrepreneur. I can actually say that. I'm not just a local person. I'm a real, actually, international visionary. And I just got an award in Las Vegas. It was pretty fun seen a lot of beautiful girls. There's a lot of beautiful vibes. I got to go to the biggest casinos. It was crazy. I enjoyed the experience. I've never been to Cal I've been to California. I've never been to Las Vegas. I actually drove 32 hours to California, but I've never got to go to Vegas. So I actually got this award on my birthday, which is July 10th. Some beautiful people born in July 10th, like George W. Bush or Gerald R. Ford or the King of Dubai. I think I'm a pretty unique person that's standing around here. But I don't want to toot my own horn. I just wanted to say that I actually like uh, the work that these guys are doing. I'm on the NAACP Environmental Justice Committee, and we always speak about land and trash and reducing energy costs and things like that. So it was a long, lengthy presentation. I've been here since like 7 o'clock, so I'm pretty tired, too. I'm definitely going to go home and take a nap. But I just like the work that these guys are doing. I think that it's really important for us to be able to reduce our costs and our trash and actually use this energy that this trash can produce because people burning uh, trash does go back into the air and the atmosphere. And usually it's probably going into underserved communities like my community and it's causing people to be sick. And then where's the health care? Nobody's guiding people to health care when somebody's burning trash and things like that in people's neighborhoods, regardless if it's Kentwood or Wyoming or Grand Rapids, or Hastings, or Rockford, we're all affected by this, regardless of your ethnicity, your background, we're all affected by climate change and renewable energy, and we need renewable energy and sustainable business solutions. So I completely support this project. I think that it will help Kent County be able to generate revenue where we can be able to pour that back into Kent County. Hopefully we can pour it back into our community so we can create an economic boost because I always come here and I speak about economic development and being able to see our county grow as, a, as an organization. Because we got a lot of beautiful cities. We got a lot of potential. I know the potential. I'm a visionary. I'm a true visionary. I'm not a local person. I'm an international visionary that has a vision that really changed Kent County. And I'm doing beautiful things for the youth. I'm doing beautiful things for my county. And I'm not going to stop. I've been coming here. And no, I was not avoiding you guys. I was just busy, so I didn't come when I snapped a little bit the last Kent County Commission. But I'm here boldly in you guys' face. And like I said... Kent County uh, Commissioner Steve Wooden did show me that we do have eight figures um, and that you guys are actually doing great things with the economic. I um, mean, you guys are trying to make some uh, progress, but you guys are Republicans. You guys run the board for real. I need you guys to pour funding, more funding back into our community. Thank you. Hello, Good morning. my name is Diane Druckenmiller. I live at 7540 Jericho Avenue Northeast, which is in Rockford. Um, we just wanted to say thank you to the commissioners, the stakeholders, Dar and Steve at the county for being willing to connect with us over the last couple of months on this project. Um, regardless of viewpoint or vision, we know your time is valuable. And on vision, we just wanted to put on record that Arrow continues to support this project. We're not just landfill people. I know everybody talks about kicking the tires and that's the trash people, but we do believe in something else, simply not this plan at this time. Um, I think I can speak for our competitors, WM and Republic as well, that we are open to other options as haulers. So our perspective remains that there's a downplay occurring regarding increases for our customers. 
There are many other industry factors that aren't necessarily being talked about or considered. Um, the potential for increase on businesses and residences transparently is just huge for us on this project. We're the ones that take those phone calls from your residents, and we know you've been taking them too, but when that bill comes, it's us that they reach out to. So we know there's a lot of internal communication occurring right now. We want to thank those of you that are continuing to communicate with us. And along with our competitors, we want to remain a resource. We appreciate being part of this process, and we believe we've been open, and we want to thank you for being the same. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Uh, my name is Stephen Kepley. I'm mayor for the city of Kentwood. Background is um, I've been an engineer um, professionally and I uh, worked for the city for tw uh, 20 years. I've uh, been mayor for a little over 10, so I'm mayor also uh, the city manager, head um, city administrator. So um, my history on this was probably 2017 or 18. I was asked by some of the members around this dais along with some of my peers to uh, get involved in the trash issue. And it was probably then that I received about 14 inches of documentation, uh, light reading from DAR, where I went through, and uh, started getting a taste for uh, trash. And since then, been on lots of different committees, and also on the recent um, advisory committee uh, that has been chaired by um, the county administrator. And I, I want to say, first of all, uh, you know, when, when Al first came to Kent County, I know I was one with others saying, hey, could you please do something that's really important. It's like the biggest project Kent County did, and he's done an excellent job. This process has been excellent with uh, transparency, the information. This team to the left has been excellent. We had a thousand questions, and they came back with, with data and more data and information. The process has been Excellent. So thank you for your leadership, Al. Thank you for all your hard work. This has not been easy. When asked about this project, I, I, I sort of describe it as um, one of my favorite things that I like to do, especially with my family during the holidays, is we work puzzles. Work puzzles. I know you're supposed to play puzzles. We work puzzles. 300 piece, we can get it done in a night. 500 piece, we can get it done maybe a night, maybe the next day. When you're looking at what you're facing, it is literally like a 40,000 piece puzzle. It's extremely complicated. It is not simple with simple answers. I know, I, I know, besides these guys, I'm probably the next person who knows all the data and facts. You cannot do nothing. If you decided that you want to get out of landfill business, you have an issue with your cycling and wasted energy because they are subsidized by the landfill. The wasted energy by itself, without flow control, Cannot, the market's not there unless you have such an increasingly, a very expensive tipping fees. Because right now, not again the weeds, but right now you're dealing with 270,000 tons, but the capacity is only 190, but you're getting revenue for 270. The numbers do not work. You just can't do nothing. If you really want to get out of the business, you're going to get out of all the business. And then myself and others are going to be extremely mad because of what happened to us in 2021. You wonder why the cities are backing away from wasted energy? It's because the people around this dais made a decision in 2021 to pay $42 million on the backs of just the six cities, and that's why we're mad, because it was unfair and unbalanced. If this was truly to be a third leg stool, then the full county needed to pay for the upgrades for wasted energy. So you're spending 42, is it 42 million? 42, 40 million plus on the cranes. We agree, you have to do the, the, uh, the cranes. We had submitted a letter saying, can we take this in steps? We had savings to do the cranes. You wouldn't be able to do all of it, but could we buy some time? And the answer with those votes around this table was no. That meeting was uh, a DPW meeting and it was not a pretty sight. You had a representative that uh, took the letter that was written by the six cities and called it a lie, said that the person who sent it email was a lie. That was me. And, and it, was, it was gross. It was absolutely horrid. That behavior was, at the very least, deceitful, much less absolutely immature. So that's the reason why there's a trust issue, which leads me to, I'm speaking for myself, and I think, I, I, I'm not going to say I represent all the six cities because we're still talking, but I think I can honestly say that we are cautiously supportive of this project, cautiously supportive because there's still two issues that we want um, addressed in, in clarity. 
The first one is uh, this unbalanced cost burden that you've been hearing. Some of this, uh, the, the um, uh, businesses may be carrying a higher burden than others, and that's a lot of work from uh, the Grand Rapids Area Chamber of Commerce. That's still a concern. The second concern is governance, and we've been talking about governance, what does this look like? And even on Wednesday, we had a meeting, and I suggested a, another possibility of keeping with the seven-person uh, board member, four representatives from the county, but have a supermajority in some of the rules for this board. So it would take five votes versus four votes to have major decisions made. I have a draft of some of those thoughts. That draft has gone to the cities right now. They're reviewing. I will uh, report back what one mayor said. I won't say what the mayor was. Was that my uh, minutes? I will just re Well, you're a little, you're a minute past, but uh, since you've been very patient, I'll give you another minute. Thank you, brother. Um, <laughs> this is from one of the, one of the mayors. Um, this mayor thinks it is consistent what, we're, what we're, the draft is right now with some of the concerns we have raised over the years about the current governance structure and offers an alternative which provides greater balance and greater balance to not just the cities but for the townships. So once we finalize that, we will submit it for discussion. I think it's something that, that you would um, not oppose, shall we say. Thank you, Al, for your leadership. Thank you guys for all your hard work. Um, you gotta do something. What is that something? Bottom line is whatever you do, it's gonna be a risk. Whether you go forward, it's always a risk. I think it's a calculated risk. But if you don't do um, nothing, that's a risk also because of, of wasted resources. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? If not, do I have a miscellaneous item on my agenda? <laughs> There's no miscellaneous, is there? All right. Based upon that, uh, we are adjourned. There is. Yeah.